I'm going to uh, call the uh, Planning and Land Use Management Committee to order. I'm Councilmember Jose Huizar. We've been joined by Councilmember Marquise Harris Dawson, Councilmember Gil Cedillo, and Councilmember Felipe Fuentes. Oh, there he is. We'll start off the agenda. And on item 13, we will receive and file item 13, which is a report from the Director of Planning. Yeah. Item 6, we will continue with no date certain yet. Item 6, continue. Item 7, if we have no cards, we could approve that on consent. Oh, we do have cards, okay, so we'll hold on to that. Item 8, we have a card. And we'll continue item 9. So item 13 and, I'm sorry, 6 and 9, we will continue. Thank you. And uh, our sergeant, are there any, uh, there's no people in the hallway, are, is there? There is people in the hallway. Yeah, how many more people? Is it a lot or 10? Oh, you guys could fit in here, right? Or no, are we capacity? Is that, that what it is? Or should we move to the larger room? Nobody wants to <laughs> There's plenty of space up here in the front row. I think we're good. There, there's space in the pews. Um, I, I don't think we need to move. There was a request of maybe we should move rooms, but I think uh, uh, there's enough space in the different pews. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So items 6 and 9, we will continue. We will start off with item number 7 and call that to order, please. Sure. Item 7, Councilman, is a Cultural Heritage Commission report relative to the inclusion of the Woolner House as a historic cultural monument. Thank you. Um, we have one speaker card on this. We were going to uh, call this on consent. Can I speak to the city attorneys, please, before I call this? Uh, uh, Am I violating anything? Yeah, you know what? Just say. Okay. Thank you. Somebody filled out a card by uh, saying F the police. Uh, if somebody wants to identify themselves and come up and speak on this card with that name. Fuck the police. Sir. Let me warn you right now that this, you're speaking on item number seven, which concerns right. an inclusion of the Woolner House yes. as a HCM. If you speak on any other item, I'm going to ask you to stop speaking. But, uh, Thank yeah, you. I just simply, you know the rules. You've been here plenty of times. I, I Thank simply you. identified the card. That's all. So once again, item seven, I've been tracking this from the Cultural Heritage Commission. Now we're here today. CD4. Thank you, David. I know he's up there listening right now, the big guy. He's the preservationist. So I know in CD4, this is one of many projects ramming its way through the Cultural Heritage Commission to come before Marquise et al. And I know you're going to approve it unanimously. Even the late Mitchell Englander would approve it if he were here. But due to his untimely demise, he can't be here today. Let us give a moment of silence and approve item number seven, especially for David. Woo! The greatest election victory ever. The greatest. Okay, on item number seven, we will approve that item with no objections. Item number eight. Item, item eight, Councilman, is a Cultural Heritage Commission report. Uh, relative to the inclusion of the Coughlin House as a historic cultural monument. Thank you. We have one public speaker on this card, Wayne from Encino. Yes, and for the record, it was not a F the police. Okay, 
Well, this is in CD 14. This is in CD 14. So now we have a third councilman who is a preservationist. He has joined the Honorable David and Paul Koretz. Now, Jose Wiesar is a preservationist. Welcome to the family of preservationists. Now we're going to approve this wonderful project, the Coughlin House. Yes, back in the days, back in those old days in that last century, people used to build houses that looked like mansions when they were just in the middle class. But now we have to protect them from the evil devils known as developer devils. So we got to get rid of those developers. So vote yes on item eight. Thank you. With no objection, we'll uh, approve item number eight. And let's get started with item number one, please. Sure. Item one, Councilman, is a DOT report relative to the DTLA forward uh, configuration and phase two of Spring Street and Main Street in downtown. Thank you. Staff here to present on this item. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Pauline Chan from Los Angeles Department of Transportation. We have submitted a report in response to the motion to prepare analysis of that would reevaluate configuration of streets in downtown, analyzing pedestrians and multimodal transportation options to make downtown more walkable and safe environment for pedestrians while improving traffic flow and reducing unneeded vehicular congestion. Um, we, are also, we were also instructed to reevaluate downtown LA street configuration starting with Spring and Main Streets between Cesar Chavez, Cesar Chavez and Olympic Boulevard. Um, currently, we are focused on uh, the latter part of the council motion we have initiated a task order solicitation to begin a project on Main and Spring, which essentially is phase two of a transformation that began when we first placed buffered bike lanes on the couplet Main and Spring. We will explore uh, the potential to upgrade these facilities into protected bike lanes uh, in and also examine uh, pedestrian needs along these two corridors and to find ways that can, a project that would incorporate pedestrian safety needs as well. Uh, Spring and Main make a lot of sense in terms of our first focus on reconfiguring streets downtown. They re represent ripe opportunities to provide um, safer facilities for pedestrians and bicyclists um, it is a these are two streets that have um, one-way configurations that present uh, a greater uh, space allocation possibilities and um, where we have certain issues that need to be delved in uh, and addressed with more innovative thinking and design. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for that report. And um, this motion was introduced uh, as a way of rethinking what the traffic patterns are in downtown Los Angeles. As we all know, it's drastically changing. A lot more people are walking, a lot more development, a lot more activity. Ten years ago, we had 10,000 people that lived there. Today, we have upward of 55,000 and a lot more residential units being planned. And as we looked at the traffic patterns, we recognized that they were planned for a time in the perhaps 60s and 70s downtown Los Angeles that no longer exists. We were thinking of finding more efficient and effective ways of these traffic patterns given the changes. So this motion had asked to uh, look at these traffic patterns and see if there's different ways of arranging the traffic patterns. The report uh, identifies Spring and Main Streets as two primary streets that we could look at to reconfigure. Um, and are those are the two that you will focus on in, in reconfiguring, or can we look at other areas in downtown as well? Uh, yes, we can um, expand on it, uh, dependent on uh, funding as well as um, uh, results of a, a crash analysis that is currently being conducted citywide. Uh, yeah. We 
we are uh, focusing in on reducing fatalities in the city under the department's Vision Zero program. Mm -hmm. So that information uh, resulting from a technical analysis will be available sometime in April of this year. I think that is a, the appropriate um, lens through which we view how to uh, treat these streets in downtown because many of the downtown arterials are on the high injury network. It also offers uh, a way of prioritizing where the reconfiguration should take place first uh, given the need to reduce crashes and given the limited resources that we have. Okay, great. So what I'd like to request that in light of this is ask DOT to report back on specific plans to reconfigure Spring and Main Street, also with a specific timeline, details on planned community outreach, engagement, and milestones, and also to work with my office and the planning department to see what types of resources will be necessary to supplement Vision Zero and the work they're doing to get the types of uh, technical data necessary to reconfigure. Uh, I know it's, it's uh, quite an endeavor here, but uh, um, I think it might be worthwhile, and there are some creative ways we could fund this if uh, we have the need and, and um, a request is made to see what type of uh, resources will be necessary here. Also, if I could ask planning to incorporate an overall study of street reconfiguration in downtown with the EIR of the community plan, is that uh, possible for the planning department? Someone here from the planning department? Yes, there you are. Good afternoon, council members. Patricia Defender for planning department staff. As you know, we are updating the downtown community plans. Um, a number of years ago, we went through an exercise to uh, apply modified street standards to m all of the streets of downtown, much of downtown. And uh, we will be looking at those designations again through the community plan update. So we will certainly be looking at that and incorporating any potential changes in our analysis in the EIR. Okay, so that could be incorporated into that, and in the timing is, still uh, can. Okay. It is part of what we it look at when we do the community plan update. Okay. The combination, of, you know, the mobility plan just got adopted. It looked at streets downtown, and this this offers us another opportunity to look again with um, you know different goals or new goals in mind and refine those recommendations or refine those street designations. Okay, great, thank you. So thank you very much. With that, we'll. Uh, um, be back with both of those report backs uh, when we come back and reschedule this item and we'll work with you to find a time to reschedule this. Okay, great, thank you very much. We'll continue this item, that's okay. Item number two. Um, item two, Councilman, is a DOT report. This one relates to the DTLA initiative and the leading pedestrian interval signals and a potential pilot project. Okay. Um, staff here on this item? Oh, here sure. you are. I'm Tim Framo with the Department of Transportation. So as part of the same report, um, we are including um, our recommendations for leading pedestrian intervals. Um, we have so far installed a number of these devices, um, a couple on Broadway as part of the dress rehearsal, um, three on Reseda as part of the Great Streets, and three on Cesar Chavez as part of the Great Streets, and most recently, uh, 14 downtown as mitigation for the regional connector. We have conducted a cursory analysis of, of the first location on Broadway, um, and it, it shows some promise, but ultimately what we need to do is a more in-depth crash analysis of uh, m multiple locations, which is part of the Vision Zero toolbox of countermeasures. That, as uh, Pauline mentioned earlier, is a citywide measure, and we see that as the best opportunity to expand the use of leading pedestrian intervals downtown and elsewhere once we determine that you know there are specific crash problems that the LPI can best address at those locations. And that's a way for us to, to essentially prioritize locations given our limited resources, knowing that we can't do all locations, but prioritizing those that have crash issues that the LPI can address. Uh, thank you. Along with uh, item number one, um, on this one, if we could ask uh, the Department of Transportation to report back in 180 days on an analysis on the newly implemented LPIs throughout downtown Los Angeles. Also, um, 
report back in 108 days on the status of Vision Zero technical collision analysis findings relevant to possible implementation of leading pedestrian interval signal treatments within downtown Los Angeles, along with the status of the associated countermeasure pairing exercise. We'll see that in 100 days. Thank Have you. any of you guys experienced this, the LPIs? No? Nobody's as excited about this as I am? All right, good, yeah. Before you start walking across the street, the green light goes for the pedestrian so that if a car is turning right, you sit there, <laughs> you, get an, and you, you sit there and wait for the pedestrian. You're correct, Mr. Marquis. And then uh, the pedestrian gets a head start to get more visibility for the pedestrian. So anyway, thank you. We started this on Broadway. Thank you, sir. We started this on Broadway, and then as we work with Metro, uh, they were going to shut down some streets because of the construction of the regional connector. We asked them to mitigate the uh, traffic around the area, and we asked them to do a, f a few more, and we got about 15 more in downtown, so we're asking to provide some analysis of that and the reductions and what we expect to be a reduction of um, pedestrian collisions, and so we'll look forward to that data. Uh, we'll continue this item for 180 days. Item number three. Item three, Councilman, is a city planning report. This one relates to the relates to the DTLA, TTLA forward initiative and uh, using the Harlem Place Alley as a model for pedestrian and green alleys in downtown. Welcome. Hey. Good afternoon, Council Members Brian Eck with the Department of City Planning. Um, so related to alleys, City Planning was directed to examine the Harlem Place Alley as a model for developing a comprehensive uh, approach to green and pedestrian alleys across the city, and to then further identify spaces that might provide an opportunity for similar types of improvements. So the Harlem Place Alley project includes several design elements, um, which include uh, permeable paving, um, LED lighting, movable planters, overhead string lighting, decorative paving, and uh, decorative gates. So across the city, the desire for expanded alleys uh, along these lines, um, we're seeing an increased uh, amount of desire to see these types of improvements. Um, these include um, opportunities for pedestrian circulation, uh, space for recreation, outdoor dining and retail activities, as well as stormwater management and other greening opportunities. So there is a need for um, streamlining the regulatory guidance um, to integrating traditional alley service functions um, and new improvements in alleys which public ownerships can be maintained. So a pilot green uh, shared or pedestrian alley project could provide an opportunity to identify uh, departmental roles and processes, streamlining strategies, and barriers to implementation. A pilot alley could also be an opportunity to create a guidance document for future green shared and pedestrian alley projects throughout the city. And finally, through the update to the downtown community plans, uh, a comprehensive examination of land use circulation and open space will provide an opportunity to identify alleys that may be suitable for these types of alley improvements. All right, thank you. You know, this motion uh, was introduced uh, because of um, increased demand for more pedestrian green alleys along downtown. Many of them are underutilized or not utilized or abandoned that um, are not well maintained and taken care of. Uh, while there's a, a need for more public space in downtown, we saw an opportunity to create these alleyways and recreate them in a way that um, uh, uh, we're expanding public spaces for people to enjoy and walk, et cetera. So this motion actually asked the department to identify other appropriate spaces and opportunities for pedestrian alleys and green alleys in downtown. I don't see these spaces identified in the report back. Has this been done? Will it be done? Or where sure. are we in the yeah, process? As part of the downtown community plan program, I think we're going to look at you know comprehensively our open space network, our streets, and find places where there are um, suitable conditions to find uh, opportunities for shared and public alleys. You know, I can say that um, the concentration of alleys to, in downtown is really located in the Arts District, the Fast District, and um, South Park, which is probably where we're going to find these opportunities in the future. Okay. Um, we have here a number of um, a framework by which we believe we could move forward. We'll, we'll forward that to you uh, in writing. Okay. Um, but for now, if we could ask the planning department to create and analyze three pilots of three different types of LA projects in downtown to be used to develop processes and guidelines that can be utilized for projects across the city. 
Uh, for example, Harlem Place Alley is a is an alley that's been on the books for some time to be converted, but through either city bureaucracy or I'm not quite sure what's holding us back from doing that. Um, this would be a great pilot pilot for an alley project that utilizes alley um, vacation, but yet it's still open for the public and it's really still considered a public space. Mm-hmm. Uh, the South Park Bids Alley project is uh, a pilot for a project. It can be a pilot for a project that is led by a bid that is willing to assist with funding, maintenance, and operations. That's another example. And an alley project in the Arts District led by a community organization, Industrial District Green, um, they've been uh, moving forward um, by uh, uh, their example and their use of just uh, making it more of a green walkway. So we could use those three as models to see how we could expand those and, and perhaps um, um, uh, extrapolate from them uh, the processes within the city to make this easier for either a third party or the city itself to move forward and, and create more pedestrian and green alleyways. Okay, thank Great. you. Thanks. So we'll actually move this item um, to full council. I understand that this item needs to be uh, moved to council and then brought back to Plum on the report backs. We'll do that with this item if there's no objection. And if we could reopen items uh, one, two as well um, with no objection and forward them to council and then we'll hear back the report backs. I've been told that's a proper procedure for us to take. So. Any objection to sending them to full council? Seeing none, so ordered. Chair. Yes, ma'am. Um, these are also referred to transportation committee, so they would need to hear it first. Okay, they're also referred to transportation? Correct. Okay, good. Okay, I'm there. We have uh, one public speaker on this. Um, F the police. So is this items one, two, and three? You didn't call my cards on one and two. I found your cards for two and three. I can't find your card for one. So I'm going to request that you uh, speak on item three right now, and I will. Yeah, you can speak on two and three. That's all. Okay, one. good. All right. Two minutes. Okay, eight minutes. Okay. So we got the the Harlem Place Alley project. Well. You cannot use federal funds to repair alleys. They're not highways. So you've got to keep that in mind. Every time you go and you fund these projects and you go for road work construction, federal funds cannot be used to repair highways. So you're going to make the alleys green spaces. That's kind of ridiculous. I see one person on the panel just laughing himself silly over there because he knows you can't do that. Alleys are roadways, but they're not highways. That's right. Yeah, Marquise understands. You got to know what to do. You got to get the funding. You got to get state dollars for this project, not federal funds. And then, what is all this, this, this double talk here? The Vision Zero. Why do we have to have all these names? Vision Zero. Leading pedestrian interval signal treatments, pilot imp- implementation. It's simple. You go down Broadway and you got those giant planters, you have nowhere to goddamn park. The place is down to one lane each. The buses can't move. The people can't move because you got those sand lots and those giant planters with those dead plants inside of them. How are you going to move people with dead planters and dead planters and dead planters in the middle of a street? You cannot open highways by blocking highways. You're blocking highways and not opening highways. That means you're jeopardizing federal funds on the remaining roads because you're privatizing and quasi-privatizing highways. Now, somebody over here from Lantham and Watkins will get smart one of these days. They'll sue in class action to take away all your federal funding from all of those streets. Lantham and Watkins Thank is Thank you very much. They're Thank watching. you, sir. Lantham and Watkins Always a pleasure. Watching. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Item number, oh, we have one more speaker card on three. General Jeff.
Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, committee members. Um, as a uh, Skid Row community activist and former uh, representative on the board of directors for the Downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council, um, who actually can speak directly to our neighborhood council being positively active in supporting uh, Harlem Place alley renovations and green space concepts, um, definitely in full support of this moving forward and the exciting uh, and tremendous opportunities it is to see the greening of Harlem Place and many other um, alleyways, not only in downtown Los Angeles, but throughout all of the city of Los Angeles. So we're excited for this to move forward and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, General Jeff. I recently saw your article, General Jeff, uh, with uh, the work you used to do with DJ Quick and Radio and Joe Cooley. I like that. All right. Item, uh, we'll uh, send this to full council. Okay. With no objection. So ordered. Item number four. Um, item four, councilman, is a motion. We our price. It's um, instructing city planning to report back on its DTLA initiative on street three pallets um, in the South Park neighborhood. I think it's your, it's your mic problem. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, the motion is before you, Council. Thank you. Welcome. You know what? We, we just uh, we could know and file this, I understand, unless you want to report on it. I understand that the report has been completed. completed. The tree pallet for downtown is going to be included in the design guidelines, is that correct? That's correct, which okay. is headed to uh, City Planning Commission uh, of summer of this year. Thank you. Well, I want to thank uh, the Planning Department and the South Park bid for working on this. This motion was submitted a while back to find ways to green downtown a little bit more, and, and this uh, tree pallet um, uh, program is going to help us achieve that and put it in the design guidelines. So thank you very much. Yeah. We'll, we'll note and file this item. Oh. Receive and file. What's the difference? Well, actually, it's, since it's the first time in committee, you may want to adopt the motion, Councilman. Okay, we'll because, adopt? Yeah. It was waived out of Public Works Committee. Okay. So may, the, the easiest thing is to simply to adopt it. Okay, yeah, we'll adopt it. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, no objection? For the record, only the uh, motion was uh, waived. The report is still before the Public Works and Gang Reduction Committee. Thank you. I'm sorry. Before we do that, um, we have speaker cards. F the police and uh, General Jeff. Yes, so street tree pallets and guidelines for tree removal? What the hell do we need that for? In this room, last Friday I was here. Kevin James and the Board of Public Works are the tree killers. They kill the trees for you. It's a commission dedicated to killing trees, chopping trees down. Everybody comes in from the community. You can hear the trees out there. Jose, don't kill us. But you keep chopping them down. Nobody wants these trees chopped down. Stop Kevin James from chopping down any more city trees. Save the trees. Don't cut them down and replace them with those cheap little trees you see out there. As soon as the wind blows, they blow them from here to Anaheim. Half of your replanted trees, they just uproot them in the first wind. We need sustainable communities. No more tree killing. General Jeff. Excuse me. Good afternoon, General Jeff again. Um, in regards to street trees, obviously, for the sake of development, uh, certain trees have to be removed, but it's... Uh, you know, not that they're going away. We, we appreciate the fact that they will be replaced. Um, something that myself and uh, Russell Brown um, created when we were on the uh, Downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council Planning Committee um, was the concept of a tree bank so that when developers come and they want tree variances as opposed to the city should really consider instead of just, uh, you know, totally alleviating, omitting um, those numbers of trees, because we definitely need green, we need the greenery. Um, and if they can't put them on, attach them to their properties, then they should be able to put them in a tree bank that can be used in other areas around the city so that there will be no 
variance, it actually be a replacement and so it in somewhere else. So the concept of a tree bank. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll uh, adopt this motion with no So objection. just to be clear, we'll adopt the motion and note and file the city planning report. There you go. Okay. Thank you. So ordered. Item number five. Um, item five, Councilman, is a city attorney prepare ordinance um, relative to the operation of homeless shelters in any zone during the 2016 El Nino weather cycle. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Um, I believe the city clerk has an updated draft that she has passed out to you for your consideration. Um, would you like me to go through the ordinance or just highlight the changes that are in the draft before you? you just uh, briefly go over what the ordinance entails. And then, okay. Yeah. So on November 18th, the city council considered um, the state of emergency issue, shelter crisis issues, and from that, Motion 14A was adopted. And that had several... Uh, programs and directives and instructions um, for various parts of the city to come back with ordinances or um, programs to to be considered by council. The second one was a request for the city attorney to prepare and present an ordinance to amend the municipal code to maximize the city's authority to provide temporary shelter pursuant to the declaration of a shelter crisis. We prepared two ordinances. The one that is before you today uh, is for the duration of the period of the El Nino weather emergency uh, for this year only. Um, it does, it is a self uh, sunsetting ordinance. It includes a definition of shelter for the homeless that specifies that uh, nonprofit organizations, religious institutions, um, government agencies, charitable organizations can, on their property, uh, open temporary homeless shelters to provide additional space for the homeless during um, the rains of El Nino. And it would only be in, in effect for 120 days from the date of um, its effectiveness, which is uh, pursuant to the urgency ordinance when it's published. Um, we do have the findings that you can make to allow for the use of an urgency ordinance because this is an emergency and um, it's a matter of health and safety. Um, the, pursuant to our uh, transmittal of Rule 38 letters to the Departments of Building and Safety, Fire, and Housing, we received some feedback and before you is an updated ordinance that integrates their requests. The Fire Department has cold weather shelter guidelines that provide for minimum fire life safety um, elements to be integrated into any of these projects. Um, it sets an occupancy, which is 49 or less, uh, requires a 24-hour fire watch, um, requires that a basic fire alarm sounding device is provided, provides fire extinguishers, um, and smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. So per their request, in Section 1282, a shelter can be established on property owned or leased by a provider if it complies with the cold, wet weather temporary shelter requirements promulgated by the fire department. Um, moreover, the Department of Building and Safety requested that unreinforced masonry and non-ductile concrete buildings not be used as homeless shelters. And that's consistent with recent ordinances that you've adopted requiring those buildings to be reinforced for earthquake safety. Finally, the um, Department of um, HCID um, requested that the order of the whereas clauses be changed. They felt it read better, so we've done that. The first one used to be the third one. It's a minor change. Thank you very much, and um, thank you for your um diligent work on this and as we all know the city is taking a more proactive approach to addressing the crisis of homelessness in our city I'm very pleased to have with us here on this committee uh, the chair of that committee Marquise Harris Dawson and uh, Councilmember Sadio is also a part of that committee um, and we're presented with the reality that some 18,000 people sleep unsheltered in the city uh, on any given night um, the committee and the council have asked that we expand our ability to establish crisis housing and emergency shelter in the city 
This is particularly important in light of the El Nino season. Although the rainy season has been much drier than the expert had predicted, uh, we are still told that there may be heavy rains over the next couple of months, and that's why we still need this ordinance. Uh, for this reason, it's important that we allow emergency shelter where providers are ready and willing to offer it. This is the purpose of today's action. Uh, next week, the committee will hear additional changes to our laws around declaring a shelter crisis so, uh, as it relates to longer-term operation of shelters, uh, and we will have a chance to explore that in more depth next week. My one question I do have is you prepared one ordinance that has 90 days uh, and one that has 120 period. The 120 period would take us into summer, so it would make it, um, I mean, this is for the, for the purposes of a uh, difficult uh, season, right, for additional rains, et cetera. So a 90-day could perhaps suffice. I mean... Correct, and that's a policy decision by council. When it was prepared, it was obviously in advance of um, CPC's consideration, so at that time there was a different um, schedule. Um, I do have an ordinance that allows for a 90-day uh, effectiveness, and I can give that to the clerk to provide if that is the ordinance that the committee wants to consider. Yeah. This draft ordinance includes the changes I previously described. Okay, thank you. And I understand these sites uh, will be allowed in any zone, but that doesn't mean that my neighbor could put something up, right? That, that Correct. That, right, it's allowed in any zone, but it's limited to certain institutions that are described in the definition, and they have to own or lease their property. And again, they, they have to maintain their primary use. So this is a secondary use, and their primary use still has to adhere to the zoning code, any CEP on their property, and any regulations that apply. And nuisance laws will still apply, correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any questions or comments on this? Okay, we'll go to public comment, and then Scott Sale, F the Police, and General Jeff. I have... <clears throat> I don't really know where to start other than I'm Scott Sale, member Leo Beck Temple. Nice to see everybody. Um, so I want to applaud the committee and, uh, and planning for at least delving into this in the city attorney's office. We've been working on this at our synagogue for five years, and it seems like we're finally making a little progress, but I am confused, uh, to say the least, although I know these ordinances that we just heard about are temporary and next week maybe we're going to get something that's more permanent like a safe parking plan. I understand that. It still is confusing and it feels like a rather encircling uh, discussion here. So I want you guys to know that uh, I've gotten two calls recently as being a safe parking advocate and I know safe parking is included and can be included loosely in these ordinances, but I've gotten two calls of people who've been harassed living on the street properly in a city zone that, where they're allowed to park, and yet they've been harassed. And one guy who just got a job and just got his vehicle, got his car firebombed. So please take that into consideration. I will be back next week and hear more of the details. Thank you. Great. Thank you. F the police and uh, General Jeff. F the police. Yes. El Nino, it's over. The big fallacy. El Nino no ocurrió en Los Angeles. Es una mentirosa grande. Un producto de los judíos y otros monetistas. So, this is not going to happen. It's over. It was a fallacy. I was right here last year and I told you it's a lie. It ain't going to happen. It's going to rain, but it ain't going to be a deluge. That's the term all of the people at Lantham and Watkins use. It has to be a deluge. So it's not a deluge, so we just had some rain. It's over. Shelf this thing. Don't turn parking lots into homeless shelters. If you're going to do that, get RVs from Thompson RV and rent them out as Airbnb rentals. Just do that. Airbnb rentals by the beach over in Pacific Palisades. Make some money. General Jeff. Good afternoon, committee. General Jeff from Skid Row. Um, I appreciate the city's and this committee's proactive uh, position in regards to uh, addressing the homeless issues. Obviously, my constituents uh, is very um, concerned about this. and. Um, 
Um, while I haven't actually read the actual language on the uh, amendment to really speak to that, um, as a point of clarification in the language, in the motion, I think that it should be clear is when it said that this applies to any zone, I think it should be made clear what zones are you specifically speaking to. I have no idea. Um, I'm pretty sure there are others in the public that have no idea either. Um, also, too, there is a concern in regards to funding for any um, facilities that actually uh, partake in this process. Um, there's going to be additional uh, uh, cost um, incurred in regards to whether they're providing cots, blankets, pillows. There's going to be need uh, cleaning uh, materials to clean the facilities on and on and on. And so I hope those costs are also factored in. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, colleagues, I ask that uh, I'll move that we adopt the version with the 90 days um, on it. Any objection? Seeing none, so ordered. <laughs> Item number 10. So, so we approve the city attorney ordinance with the 90 days. Yes, sir, okay. that version. Um, item 10, Councilman, is an appeal by Mickey Jackson of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. This item has to do with the Palladium Project, and this issue relates to the vesting track map for, to permit one master lot and 19 airspace lots for the mixed-use project in CD13. Sorry, if we could take up 10, 11, and 12 together, please. Yes, and item uh, 12, Councilman, is the motion to initiate... Uh, he said he wanted them together. No? No. Did you want item 12 as well? Um, Terry Coppin, Messia, City Attorney's Office. Um, 10 and 11 can go to, together, but 12 needs to go separate. I got you. 10 and 11. Okay, yes, so sorry. You. So item 11 is the other entitlement uh, relative to the conditional use, the zoning administrator interpretation, the site plan review, the zone change, and the uh, GPA for the Palladium project in CD13, and as well as the appeal by Mr. Miki Jackson. Staff here, make a brief presentation on this item, please. Good afternoon, Lucy Barra with the Major Project Session section of the Department of City Planning. Um, I'll just present briefly the case. The case, the cases before you are related to the development of 731 residential units and 24,000 square feet of retail and restaurant uses as well as the maintenance and preservation of the Palladium venue. Before you are appeals of the tract 72213 and appeals of the City Planning um, Commission recommendations relative to the general plan amendment, the zone change, height district change, conditional use, zoning administrator's interpretation, and site plan review. Yesterday, the Department of City Planning submitted two letters, one in reference to recommended um, typographical corrections, um, as well as clarifications to the findings relative to the determination of the City Planning Commission on the tract, as well as similar um, modifications and edits for the City Planning Commission's recommend, um, recommended, recommended actions and findings relative to the other legislative and uh, quasi-judicial um, entitlements. Um, that's a very brief summary of what the project is. I understand that the applicant, as well as the appellant, um, is here to present their um, assertions of the case. So um, I'd recommend that if you can bring me back so I can contest or address any of the issues that are raised in those testimonies. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm in the process of finding the appellant's um, public speaking cards, and I, um, so they could speak first. So the appellants of record, who are the appellants of record here? It's Councilman, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, and Mr. Daniel Wright from the Silverstein Law Firm is a representative. Oh, okay. I, I don't have your card, Mr. Wright. Did you tip, fill out a card? You did? I did. I okay. Did. Okay. Well, you could go. You're representing the appellants? Yes. Okay. Go right ahead. Uh, the appellants and representatives of the owners have five minutes. All other speakers have one minute. So you have five minutes, Mr. Wright. Good 
Good afternoon, council members. My name is Daniel Wright of the Silverstein Law Firm. On behalf of AIDS Healthcare Foundation, let the record reflect that today we uh, submitted really an, an expansion of our previous letters and objections. So a lot of it is a repetition of some of the materials that you already have before you. Uh, I'd like to enter an objection about the length of time that we're being offered today to present our case. Um, this appeal really um, raises a number of really important um, public policy issues. Number one has to do with the appropriateness uh, or the legality of requesting and the city processing a general plan amendment under Charter Section 555A. Under that section, um, the city does not have the authority to uh, process project by project or parcel by parcel general plan amendments. Um, and actually, the limiting language in the charter arose out of a bribery scandal in the 1960s where council one council member went to jail for accepting bribes in exchange for parcel by parcel rezoning. Um, the reform is in the charter. It has been there all these years. And you do not have the authority to process a general plan amendment as initiated and requested by the applicant. Secondly, um, this, this, this planning staff has not rationalized how it is that the density of dwelling units in this property um, is R, based on R5 instead of R4. The plain language of 12.26 of the municipal code provides that R4 density applies. R5 does not. The, the uh, statutory uh, provision that they've cited is not, does not support their contention, and um, it's not explained in the EIR. So therefore, the doubling of the density allowed is inappropriate and simply not lawful. Um, also, there's a delimitation on the front lot on Sunset. The delimitation requires that there actually be a transportation program uh, operated by the Community Redevelopment Agency as a condition of actually um, being able to grant the increase in density. Um, it does. The, the, the record is devoid of any evidence that the, that the CRA has ever prepared that transportation program, and as a result, there is no authority to approve that increase in density. Um, and the further analysis has been submitted to, uh, in our letter today. Additionally, the project is proposed. The EIR is inconsistent with CEQA. The land use analysis dodges a lot of these issues that I just laid out. Does not describe them, does not say who's doing approvals, and in fact avoids really mentioning uh, that the Community Redevelopment Agency has a number of discretionary uh, decisions that have to be made here, none of which have um, been really acknowledged. Um, as a result, CRA is a responsible agency under CEQA, and our review of the EIR shows that they were never given a notice under the NOP process, never invited to participate in the public participation process, even though CEQA makes it a mandatory duty for the city to do so. For that reason alone, it should have been recirculated uh, when it became clear that CRA, and only CRA, has the authority to approve some of these density increases. Finally, there's the issue with regard to um, the denial of due process at the City um, Planning Commission. There was a serious admission that ex parte communications occurred with, by a majority of the members of the Planning Commission, um, and so clearly they received hours with Planning Commissioners and we received minutes. That is fundamentally unfair, the tainting the proceedings below and invalidating them. Um, this project, in sum, seeks a dramatic increase in residential density, FAR, and does not appear to be consistent with Charter Section 555, Los Angeles Municipal Code 1226, the delimitation imposed on the project site. Accordingly, also, the draft EIR fails to lay out um, an, an appropriate land use analysis and many of the other issues, uh, including um, historic resources, as identified uh, in our letter. With respect to historic resources, there's been an interesting and strange cat and mouse game going on with respect to my client's nomination of the Palladium for historic status. That application was filed last July, 
and we have not been given a hearing while other projects have been processed. That implicates our civil right to be heard before you make a decision on these entitlements. And for all of those reasons, we would request respectfully that this uh, body deny the project and send it back for an appropriately sized project, which our client and others in the community could support. Great. Thank you for your attention. Th thank you, Mr. Wright. And we are uh, taking up both items 10 and 11 now. That was five minutes for item uh, 10. You also have five minutes for uh, 11. I don't know if you want to take those up now, but you do have to split them up between yourself and your clients. So Mr. Mickey Jackson has also presented a card. You could either take uh, another five minutes or have Mr. It's up to Ms. You. Um, Ms. And, um, and actually, you know, you know, uh, perhaps that should have been um, disclosed to us beforehand. It's an issue that I've raised for quite some time about the lack of procedural hearing rules mm -hmm. at the, the city council. Um, now you're telling me that I have more time when I, I was told I had only five minutes. Um, so I guess I'd like to go back and give an opportunity to gather my thoughts. Well, you don't have to use up your five minutes now. I mean, we, I'm taking them in subsequential order. Are you 10? going to take these items? Okay, it wasn't clear at the outset. Yeah, yeah. Is, are you going to take these items, one, first one and then another? I, I'm taking the discussion together, but the speaker cards, I'm taking them separately. So as presented, but I'm giving okay. you an opportunity as an appellant to use your five minutes now or use them later. That's what I'm, you, you have your option. I'll just try to give you an additional option. Well, uh, I guess another interesting question is whether or not um, there's any right Excuse me, Terry Kaufman, sure. Macias, you've got someone who's testifying not on the clock, so I think yeah. it was clear okay. what, you're, what you okay. were asking. And uh, that's we're fine. just trying to figure out what the procedure is. Mr. Wright, I'll just hold your five minutes now or five minutes later, sir. It's okay. I was trying to offer you an alternative if, to help you, but if, I would just save your five minutes for number eleven. Well, That's well fine. so is then that five minutes going to be for presentation or is it going to be for rebuttal? I mean, because I don't there's know. No, this is not a court. Uh, a court, sir. This is a legislative hearing. Rebuttals. We do is not common. have rebuttals. We do not have presentations. We just have hearings. Okay. okay. So thank right, you. So no, you'll be calling you. me back at an appropriate I'm point. I'm going to call you back okay, after. Okay, that's yes, fair. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Okay. Now, Mickey Jackson, uh, although you are the uh, app appellant, you have one minute if you so choose to use that right now for item number 10. Hi. <laughs> Uh, before I start, I just wanted to say I, I actually have no plans to change my gender, although I'm very pleased <laughs> that the city council has a transgender coalition now, but I don't intend to join it. Um, I am very concerned that the Palladium historic nomination has, has not been heard in a timely fashion. It seems to have disappeared and then reappeared. Excuse me for a moment. Terry Kaufman, Macias City Attorney's Office. So the, the Palladium nomination is going to be heard as a separate item. What's before um, the committee now are items 10 and 11. The nomination is item 12, so that, that's separate. So you can come speak it on those comments when that item is called. Well, this is kind of part of the whole thing, but but uh, I, I wouldn't want to upset you further. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, now we'll hear from the owner representatives, Cindy Starrett, Peyton Hall, Bruce Menon. Um, Again, you have five minutes as appellants. Uh, two of these people could have one minute afterwards. So however you want to do that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I can just ask um, Mr. Menon from Crescent Heights, perhaps he could use our five minutes now, and then I can use the five minutes later on the legal issues. I yeah. believe that's how the other side is doing it. Yeah. And then I think Mr. Hall will speak to the next item, item uh, 12. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. You can give your name again for the record, please. I will. Bruce Menin, M-E-N-I-N. I'm a principal of Crescent Heights. Um, we have a short presentation over here that we thought would 
help uh, explain the project. I'm very proud this afternoon to be presenting the Palladium Project. This project is really about the preservation of the Palladium and the creation of housing in Los Angeles. Sorry, we're having a little technical. Uh, a short background on our company. Uh, we began over 25 years ago in Los Angeles, in West Hollywood, doing historic preservation. Uh, the lower middle shot is the Granville on Crescent Heights Boulevard. We were pioneers in the South Beach area of Miami, as well as the first people to do office to residential conversions in the historic district of Lower Manhattan. We've also done extensive amounts of uh, residential projects in the state of California. Uh, we're currently building 10,000 Santa Monica, which is on the border of Beverly Hills and Century City. NEMA, also in the lower middle, is known for a transformative project for the mid-market area of San Francisco. This combination of skills makes us feel very suited to take on the Palladium project. This project started with historic preservation. Our first announcements were that we would respect the Palladium and, and that it would be preserved for eternity. It's being nominated as a historic cultural monument. The Office of Historic Resources approves of our analysis. The State Office of Historic Preservation has actually used the Palladium residences as a case study for model outreach, and we are working with the on a conservation easement with LA Conservancy and the Hollywood Heritage. We wanted to show you the existing context, and we think it's very important to understand this. The Palladium sits on Sunset Boulevard. It's currently zoned as, as a six to one FAR. This whole request is really about preserving the Palladium where it is and putting the residential towers on the parking lots, which as you can see from this picture are currently fallow, instead of putting it where the Palladium is. The six to one FAR that's being requested for those parking lots is the same six to one FAR that's currently allowed under the, uh, on the Palladium site. But of course we're keeping the Palladium. We've employed Stanley Seidowitz, who's a world-renowned, world-class architect, to do iconic architecture for this project. You can see how the grid pattern of the facade riffs off the marquee, as well as the Art Deco modern marquee components that are reflected in the organization and structure of the building. The project is broadly supported by, its, by the community. We have only one appellant. That appellant is in the top floor of the black office building um, that's to the left. 3,500 community supporters signed uh, cards that, believe, that say they believe in the project. Every neighborhood council in the area supports it. We're very proud to have the men and women of the Los Angeles County Trades here to support the project, as well as Unite Here. The reason they support this project is because of the public benefits, as well as uh, the provision, of the, the, the preservation of the Palladium and the creation of housing. Uh, this is a transit-oriented development. We're just a few blocks from the red line. We focus on sustainability and all that we do com company-wide. We're providing a historic exhibit to celebrate the history of the Palladium. Neighborhood retail is our focus. We're creating hundreds and thousands of jobs, and the project um, will feature iconic architecture. Uh, here you can see some, we do an extensive amount of bike storage. Here's our proximity to the metro subway. Sustainable design for us includes electric vehicle charging, solar panels, drought resistant plants. As I mentioned, we're doing a historic exhibit for those that can't go to a show at the Palladium. They can appreciate its history. This project will create over 4,000 jobs, over $500 million worth of economic benefits during construction, as well as tens of millions of dollars of ongoing benefits, and it will be built all union. The architecture, as I mentioned earlier, is iconic. It riffs off the Palladium. It's been extremely well received by the architectural community. The grid is not only present in the Palladium, it's also part of the LA grid, and that makes the architecture all the more relevant to its locale in Los Angeles. You can see here the modern features as well as the grid and how it's reflected in the architecture. Next slide. Very important. Part of the project's uh, planning not only involved important architecture, but the way the project was created from a pedestrian standpoint. For the first time, pedestrians will be able to access all four streets through the project. So you'll be able to now walk through Sunset all the way to Selma, as well as across from Argyle to El Centro. So this creates a walkable city, uh, courtyards, neighborhoods. Uh, that people want to uh, participate in and, and hopefully when they go to see a show at the Palladium, stay in and continue to participate in the community. Last. Uh, Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much. I just have to be fair with everybody in their allotted time. Uh, 
Cindy Cindy Sterrett, Peyton Hall. We're back to one minute now, and then we're going to go one minute for the rest of the public comment. If we have five minutes remaining, um, Mr. Yes, Chair. Yes, on number 11. I'm going yep. uh, systematically through the cards as they were submitted, 10, then 11. So okay. you have five minutes remaining after I go through some more comments, but you have one minute now if you so choose. Okay. I'll just do one minute now then. Okay. Okay. Um, good morning. I'm Cindy Starrett from Latham & Watkins on behalf of the Palladium. And just to briefly note uh, the plan amendment that Mr. Menon referenced, uh, the parking lot that he showed you is in blue on this map. Everything that's red around it is already regional commercial, and the plan amendment will make the parking lot regional commercial as well. Uh, that allows us to push the development behind the Palladium, as Mr. Menon mentioned. Uh, the opponents are opposing that plan amendment. By the way, if we kept the current zoning there, we could build 1.5 FAR, for example, a big box retail, and create a lot more traffic than this project creates. So um, staff has explained why the plan amendment is appropriate. There are findings before you. The Planning Commission um, adopted those findings. But we ask that you approve the entitlements that are before you today. Uh, in terms of the other details in the appeal, uh, we'll respond to those in, in our remaining time. But the entitlements are correct, and we ask that you adopt them. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Peyton Hall. I'm Peyton Hall, Historic Resources Group. I've worked with Crescent Heights on the Palladium for several years. I also worked on the restoration of the Palladium that was completed in 2008. Crescent Heights plans have always included protecting the Palladium. The project specifies additional rehab and repair work that will be performed. Crescent Heights supports the nomination of the property, and the property is honored that the designation is put forward by Councilman Mitchell Farrell. We are now writing a nomination of the Hollywood Palladium excuse to me, the National... Excuse me. Terry Kaufman, Messiah City Attorney's Office. We're not talking about that item right now. That's item 12. So yeah, if you're yeah. talking about the nomination and the monument, you need to hold those comments for the... Um, when that item is called. Thank you. Thank you. Beth McNamara, Richard Saldivar... Joseph Molina. And again, our public comment is one minute. On item 10 and 11, if you could uh, read those again. Sure. Robert. Um, item 10, Councilman, relates to, relates to an appeal. Um, item 10, Councilman, relates to an appeal by Mickey uh, Jackson. Her appeal uh, is her appeal and her representative is uh, Daniel Wright. This one relates to the track map, track map for the project. Number 11 relates to all the other uh, entitlements, the conditional use, the site plan review, the zoning and administrator's interpretation, the GPA, the zone change, and the height district change. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. Uh, my name is Beth McNamara. I am a parent at a, a local public charter school in Hollywood, and I'm here to support the Palladium because they've supported our school. I believe that their developers are coming in. It's, that's how our city is changing. But what is really nice about this project is they're not just developing buildings, they're developing relationships, which is key. As a public school parent, we're trying to create the best education for our kids with the lowest amount of dollars. And when we have issues, we have people that can help us. And they've been one of those people. I even brought my kids down here to see the political process. They're over in the corner. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, we are uh, members of the committee. My name is Richard Zaldivar. I represent the Wallace Las Memorias Project, which is the HIV AIDS organization in Los Angeles. We are here to support the project. Uh, today, it's so easy uh, for people to be against something, but very difficult times for when people can come together and support what is really good for our community. It, rep it represents housing. It re represents jobs. It represents a new economy for that community. And I think that it also will help uh, a landmark, truly re uh, keep a landmark like the Hollywood Palladium, and get rid of that horrible parking lot 
uh, and build something that is new and refreshing to our community. So we support the project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. My name is Joseph Molina, Molina. Alfredo, Felix Padilla Villalobos. Okay. Go ahead, sir. My name is Joseph Molina. I'm here to support the Palladium 100%. And uh, according to my research, the, the Palladium has been around for 75 years, and I think it should go on for another 75 years because of the site that is on around a good area in Hollywood. And that's all I could think of right now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah, um, there. Uh, all right, I'm done. <laughs> You don't Thank have you. to use all your time if you don't want to. So that okay. you feel like you finished it, yeah, that's I'm fine. Finished. Thank you all very right. much. Good afternoon, committee members. I'm Alfredo Hernandez, project manager and founding board member of the Friends of the Hollywood Central Park. As a lifelong resident of Hollywood, I'm excited to see the underutilized and wasted surface parking lots being repurposed into the beautiful development you just saw. A particular note is the developer's commitment to supporting this community as well as their track record of staying and supporting the communities they develop in long after their projects are completed. I ask that you support this project and not buy into the propaganda that attempts to bring down an excellent project that stands on its own merit. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alfredo Aguayo. I'm here to support the project as well. And that's all I have to say. I don't want to restate everything. Great. Thank you. Hi, my name is Felix Padilla Villalobos. I just want to say quick words. Um, when I walk through Hollywood, it's, um, it's not a secret that you bump into a lot of violence in, in that area. Uh, Something I saw here, uh, uh, one of the benefits of the Palladium is uh, it'll increase tax revenue for the city. Uh, I think it'll be a good idea t to improve policemen, um, more policemen uh, funding. And that's why I support the Palladium. Uh, it brings more revenue for the, uh, more tax revenue for the city to spend on police and uh, firemen as well. Great. Thank it. you. Thank you. Kenny Gagan, Larry Goldman, Ernesto Medrano. Go first. Yeah. I'll go first. Good afternoon. I'm Lori Goldman. I'm chair of the Hollywood Network Coalition. We are a broad based coalition of residents, businesses, educational institutions, and nonprofit organizations. The Palladium Residence is a very important project for us in Hollywood, and it is compatible with the urban context. The applicant has listened to the community, he's addressed our concerns, is providing a wonderful, excellent community benefits package, and I urge you all to please support this project. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, I'm Ernesto Medrano with the Alley Orange County Building and Construction Trades Council. And Los Angeles still is recovering from the recession and needs good union jobs to support our working families. The construction of the Palladium Residence will bring uh, and create more than 2,000 good paying construction jobs and more than 4,000 total, providing more than $200 million wages to workers. The Palladium Residence's construction will create a half billion dollar boost to our regional economy. After it's complete, the project will create up to 500 new jobs. Uh, this is tens of millions of dollars a year in wages being paid to Angelinos who desperately need these jobs. We're in desperate need of more housing in LA. The Palladium Residence provides that housing and it also provides housing for people that can afford it. In addition to their commitment to the workforce housing, half of the apartments will cost between $1,200 and $1,800 per month. I ask that you approve the Palladium Residence's project and the denial of the appeal and the designation of the Palladium as a historic monument. Let's get to work and let's build these. Thank you. Fabio Conti, Laron Gubler, Alfredo Hernandez. Uh, good afternoon. Sorry, my name is Fabio Conti, and I'm a stakeholder in uh, Hollywood, uh, and I'm the president of the uh, Sunset and Vine Bid. 
We welcome this great project. It's going to bring so much needed jobs, housing, and uh, class to the area. The project is perfect for the location. We really like how he, the project links the old with the new. Ever since uh, Chris and I came to Hollywood, they've been reaching out to the different parts of the community and address all the concerns with intention to bring all the best services, amenities, and uh, benefits that the area deserves. The developers are focusing on creating a living model that we foresee in the future of Hollywood. Palladium residences are a great addition to the bid, and we are looking forward to a long-lasting cooperation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Laron Gubler, President and CEO of the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce. We're here to support this project today. As you know, Los Angeles has one of the worst housing shortfalls in the nation. This is the type of project that we need in order to close that gap. And if we don't do anything, we're just going to drive up the cost of existing stock. The location of this project is only one block from a subway station. This is where density should occur, near, uh, near mass transit. No one is going to be displaced by the project. Uh, it's going to replace, as you've heard, existing surface parking lots with an exciting, well-designed project by a prominent California architect, Stanley Seidowitz. And it's the type of project we need in Hollywood. If you can't build density uh, near mass transit, adjacent to existing high-rises in Hollywood, then where can you build it? It's time we move forward, creating a, a walkable urban environment in our city and meeting the housing needs of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Alfredo Hernandez, Bobby Pepe, Brandon Helfer, Scott Sanchez. Alfredo Hernandez is not here, right? Are you here? Nope. Well, my name is Scott Sanchez. I'm a local business owner and resident in Hollywood. I just want to say that I'm for this project. This is truly a design that millennials can walk to a marketplace, go to a gym, tr go to the transit, visit anybody in the city, and I approve this project and see no better place in Hollywood, and I'd be proud to call this a place to live. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brandon Helfer. I'm the uh, owner of Proper Parking Company. We uh, actually operate the Hollywood Palladium right now. And I have uh, nothing but good things to say about these guys. They give back to the community. They're always trying to help out. I've visited them in San Francisco, and they give back to that community as well. And uh, as you can see, the facade is beautiful, and the city can definitely use something like this, and we're really looking forward to it. Thank you. So you, you currently operate Hollywood Palladium? Yes. You do? Okay, cool. I saw one of my favorite bands there a couple of weeks ago, Suicide or Tendencies. But, all right. <laughs> Bobby Pepe. Good afternoon, Chairman. How are you today? Uh, my name is Bobby Pepe. I support the uh, Palladium Residences. Um, I've lived in CD13 for over 30 years. Uh, because of the severe housing shortage in Los Angeles, my nieces and nephews can only dream of someday owning a home in our city as my husband and I do now. Because of the high demand and artificially limited supply, of ho supply home, homes are now out of reach in CD13 for, for a whole generation of young, middle, and working class families. What our neighborhoods need is construction of hundreds of thousands of new rental and single family homes over the next several years. What is especially troubling for me as a member of the positive community is that AIDS Health Care Foundation being used as a personal piggy bank by AIDS Health Care Foundation CEO Michael Weinstein in this specious fight against the Palladium Residences. Oscar Arslanian, Cole, I think it's Maria Cole, or Maria Cole, Gladys Zapata, Maria Cole. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Oscar Arslanian. I'm the publisher of Discover Hollywood Magazine uh, and had my business for 35 years at the historic crossroads of the world on Sunset Boulevard. <clears throat> Our publication is devoted to promoting the unique culture and lore of Hollywood. That's why I'm so happy to see the Palladium Residences Project coming to our neighborhood. 
And not only does the project provide badly needed new housing, but it will restore and celebrate one of the most culturally significant venues in Los Angeles, actually in the entire country. The Palladium is a community resource, and I am glad that the Palladium re residences will maintain the iconic venue as a primary focal point of the uh, project. I appreciate that the project is reasonable in scale relative to neighboring properties and look forward to seeing how much, how much more new, new activity the Palladium residences will bring to a, an area that's been overlooked in the uh, uh, history of Hollywood. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maria Kelly. I live in the neighborhood. I think this project is beautiful. It's going to make the city more attractive to tourists. Uh, finally, we're getting to be sophisticated like New York, with the only difference that we need more allocation for people to live, more apartments, and I especially like the idea that the, this project is going to be helping the local schools. Thank you so much, and I endorse the project very much. Thank you. Chris Zapata, Alvin Gross, Brian White, John S. C. Ziegler. Hi, my name is Gladys Zapata. I support preserving the historic, the icon Hollywood Palladio, because when I came to this country, I used to go there dance with my husband. I, uh, Hollywood Palladio is a tourist place. I support the Palladio. Thank you. Thank you. I support the project of the Palladium. I don't want the Palladium destroyed. I don't want a Costco there that has been rumored. Also, the Palladium is going to have 5% affordable living for people like myself. Please approve the project. Okay. Uh, hi there, my name is Brian White. Um, I work in Hollywood a lot. I take the train, I take the bus, I ride my bike. I actually don't use a car. Um, I support the Palladium immensely because it's right by that train stop right there. I, can't, I work in Hollywood, but I can't afford to actually live in Hollywood. I'd like to be able to spend my money where I work. I'd like to be able to add to the community and the development there. Um, this, I support this building immensely. I like the bikes. I like the idea of how close it is to the train. And I like the fact that there's going to be a big public area for me to hang out with outside and be able to be. So thank you for letting me show my support. Thank you. Good afternoon, council member. My name is Johnny Ziegler, and I just wanted to let you guys know I love the Palladium and the design of the towers, but my primary reason for supporting this project is the far-reaching economic benefits. Hundreds of jobs will be created after the project is completed and thousands during the construction phase. These will be good jobs and help to encourage local growth. The Palladium residence represents half a billion dollar investments into Hollywood, and those benefits will extend to many. If we allow the no-growth community to lead the conversation, we'll lose our city within a generation. We must continue to grow our economy in a smart and responsible way. This project provides many needed homes and employs the philosophy I hope L.A. adopts across the board. Let's help to grow local businesses, encourage foot traffic, and make sure anyone who seeks residence in L.A. at least has a fighting chance. Thank you. Jorge Roberto Ramirez, Chelsea Byers, Chris Thomas. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Jorge Ramirez, and I live in Hollywood, and I do support this project for various reasons for elderly uh, people and people who really need affordable housing in the community of Hollywood. And I really like the idea to see a building that uh, is going to make the city really beautiful. That's all I got. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Chelsea Byers. I actually visited the Palladium before I lived in Los Angeles, back when I was working in northern Arizona, to oppose bad development. 
The Palladium residence is not one of those bad developments that contradicts with our values or falls outside our realm of needs. Um, I can attest firsthand to the difficulty of finding residents in Los Angeles, and uh, the mixed-use style of development here really supports the claim to creativity and innovation that L.A. embraces, and we must continue to embrace should we maintain our stature in, as a city. Um, I urge you to join me in celebrating this iconic and legendary venue by ushering in a new vision for the space that deeply aligns with the values of Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas James Litz, Marty Shelton. Hey there, my name's Chris Thomas, and I'm here to support the uh, Palladium Project. Now, as so many people before me have so eloquently put it, this project's going to bring economic stimulus, it's going to help ease the transportation issue in that area, and it's going to preserve a historic venue. So for those reasons, I support the Palladium Project, and I think you guys should put it through. Thank you. Thank you. Council members, Marty Shelton. I represent the ownership of the property at 6112 Sunset Boulevard. It's a retail center at the corner of Sunset and Gower, 35,000 square foot retail center. And the ownership supports the Palladium project. It'll bring jobs and residents to Hollywood, which is needed and helps the economy overall, and it's a good thing for Hollywood and for Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> James Litz, Brian Fold, Chuck Tyler, and Chunning Chans. Chang. Good afternoon, council members. I'm James Litz from the Beverly Hills Greater Los Angeles Association of Realtors. It's an exciting time for Hollywood. It's great. There is quality housing coming in with this project. There's over 731 units of quality housing that's in demand in Hollywood. And with that, 70 affordable units there for workforce housing. So actually, some of those people who go to work in those buildings are going to be able to live there. This is a great moment for West Hollywood. We have to keep this momentum going in Hollywood to create housing, quality housing for, the, for people to live in and make a dent in the lack of supply in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Oh, okay. Thank you. This, uh, I'm Brian Fold. I'm um, a long-term resident and commercial uh, property owner in Hollywood. Uh, my family's been there for over 50 years, and uh, I've seen the, 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 the progress of uh, Hollywood uh, over the last probably 15 or 20 years. And um, and I know what it was like before that. It's, uh, uh, we don't want to go back to those times. And it's, uh, Hollywood deserves uh, to be an iconic location in representing the city of Los Angeles. Uh, people come from all over the world, millions and millions of people, and they need to see something that's spectacular. Uh, this particular development is spectacular. It's been done and designed in the right way. They're doing all the, the right things. They're engaging with the community. These are 3,500 signatures right here of local residents that believe in this project. And uh, so it really is about making sure that the local residents uh, are are looked at in that way. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ching Chen. Um, Hollywood is the most famous place in the world, and uh, Palladium holds a very iconic role in Hollywood. Um, so I'm here to support this project because while so many people are coming to Hollywood, they are struggling because the housing shortage is a crisis here. And this project can have more people living in Hollywood and bring more business and meantime, I preserve this historical building. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Tyler, Blake Dellinger, David Perry. Thank you, council members. I'm Chuck Tyler, and as a homeless U.S. Army combat veteran, I know very intimately the frustration it is to try to find housing in a city that both you and I love and serve in. So I urge and challenge you to find the compassion in your hearts to support this project so that we can bring 731 new units into 
the city that we both work and love in, so that we can provide a home at the Palladium residences for someone like me. Thank you. I yield back to balance. Thank you. Hi, Blake Dillinger. Uh, I am a native and I went to school down the street from the Palladium. And it's been really exciting to see the area change and LA change and grow up. We're finally becoming a big boy city, a big international city. Most of my friends come from out of the country or out of, you know, LA or even out of California. And I think the reason why so many more people are coming here is because we're on this path to really being one of the best cities in the world. And that's a large contributor to our traffic and our housing problem. So we really need to push and build these houses. We're not, we don't have a housing problem, sorry. We have a housing crisis. And it's really becoming bad when natives like me are being pushed out to the fringes. Just because I live in East Hollywood, I'll probably move over to like La Cañada or something because I just can't afford my rent. And that's a little weird because I was born here. You know, so that's unfair. Um, so yeah, I, I think we like, I like this building. I support this project. This is a 21st century building. We need to have more 21st century buildings like this and stop trading our future for somebody else's past. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, City Council. My name is David Perry, and I am a neighbor in Hollywood. I have lived there for 10 years. I am here to support the development on this original Paramount Studios lot, which is now the Palladium, and I want to support the preservation of the Palladium and the housing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ryan Welch, David Flores, Rachel Torres, Jody Rath. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ryan Welch, and I'm a professional musician, composer, and songwriter, and a 13-year resident of uh, uh, Los Angeles and the Hollywood neighborhood. I, like many Angelinos, came to make this great city my home because of the opportunities it provided, opportunities built firmly upon the shoulders of its unique and wonderful history. This powerful and permeating history which is a substantial facet of American history, is the foundation which we revere and honor through living embrace. We as Angelinos understand that history is not simply a page in a book or a photo in a museum, but an integral part of our daily life. It is the basis for our realities of the present, present and it is the starting point of our aspirations for the future. The proposed Palladium Residences and Hollywood Palladium Preservation Project is a worthy example of our tradition of not just simply recognizing our history with a nod, but of truly honoring it through keeping it alive and vibrant. Through building upon its foundation, we ensure our history's Thank relevance you. to current and Sir. future generations. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is David. Um, I've been an Uber driver for about a year. And I support the Palladium because of the increased business that it's going to bring to us, to the, to us Uber drivers. And uh, there's also some concerns about traffic. But um, over the time I've been doing Uber, I've, only seen, I've, I've seen an increase in people using Uber. So um, I can only imagine that people are going to keep using it and uh, more and more people are going to just continue to use it. So like traffic is becoming less of an issue. And so, um, yeah, I just support it because of all that. Uh, there's all these other on-demand services as well. So as people keep using all these different things, um, development and, and like the problems that are the issues that people bring about against development are becoming like less unfound more unfounded. And so uh, I do I support the Palladium. Rachel Torres, Jody Rath, Dominic Jesus Rodriguez. Good afternoon, members of the City Council. My name is Rachel Torres. On behalf of Unite Here Local 11 and the 25,000 members we represent through Los Angeles and Orange County, we wish to rep um, echo the strong support for the Palladium Project. I invite my um, colleagues within the movement to stand with me because they're here on their own volition. They did not get paid to be here. They took the day off work or they came, got out of work early because they care about responsible de development. They care about good jobs. And Hollywood is the centerpiece for how development goes. And Crescent Heights and the, the proud developers of this project have set a tone for how development should go down. And we're really proud to support this project and hope that this project moves forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Jody Rath. Yes, no? Jody Rath, not here. Dominic Jesus Rodriguez. 
George Abrams, David Kirsch. Hello, my name is Dominic. Uh, I approved this project solely because it's a very nice project. And instead of putting a Costco, we should preserve our art in this city. That's what Los Angeles represents, art. Ever since, what, 1781? Right? So the housing will help people who work in the city to live in the city, to get around to their jobs more efficiently. And the green architecture also promotes a more sustainable environment. And I'm sure people are tired of driving back and forth from areas like the high desert when they could be living down the street and saving a lot of money. So that's why I approved this project. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, this city has, uh, without any increase in zoning, height, district, or general plan amendment changes, has room for one million more pe one more million more housing units and eight million more people. And uh, we don't need a general plan amendment when this project dies in court because of its obvious violation of Charter Section 555. Uh, housing will be built. It should be built. It just will be built in conformance with city's uh, planning code. GPAs are an insult to the orderly planning process, and the parade of hundreds of GPAs citywide are, 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 should not be allowed. Uh, development is supposed to be by right and within the zoning rules. Uh, the GPA here robs land from manufacturing for Hollywood entertainment industry, and by doing so, you kill the goose that lays uh, our city's golden eggs. Uh, concentrating development in the Hollywood Regional Center will destructively impact traffic for the entire Los Angeles metropolitan area. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, David Kirsch. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Carpenters Contractors Cooperation Committee, where the labor management group of the Carpenters Union and the contractors. And I'm here to show our, our strong support for this project. I have to tell you, Crescent Heights is exemplary in their outreach to, to labor. They believe in creating middle-class, good-paying jobs. They make the link between quality construction, a great project, being part of the community, and, and creating work, creating jobs. So I wish that was the case with other developers, but that's not the case. So I just want to go on the record and say that Crescent Heights is an exemplary developer in regards to just their belief in creating middle-class jobs and quality construction. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Josh Albrechtson, Millennium, Paul Clotier. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, hi, my name is Dr. Josh Albrechtson. I live here in downtown. Um, before I moved here, I actually lived in Hollywood. And I remember what it was like to see all those empty parking lots surrounding the subway station up there. Now, myself, along with most of my friends here in downtown Los Angeles, is absolutely outraged that the AIDS Health Foundation and the rich board of directors is using money that should be used to save lives to protect their own 20-second view of a building immediately next door, be sure they could drive and get their good parking, be sure their lives are good. It is selfish that they are using money that should be saving lives for their own personal reasons, and that's just outrageous, not to mention the ballot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, council members. My name is Paul Cloutier, and apparently I'm uh, the first one of this to follow this group of those in favor of it because I'm uh, opposed to this project. I live near the Palladium, a walking distance, in fact, and I am opposed to this project proposed development because the congestion in the area has only gotten worse with the new big projects going up in Hollywood, and I feel that the effects of all these projects together is not being considered. This is another massive project that is changing the neighborhood of Hollywood and that is not doing anything to help residents who have lived there for years. These projects are only available to people who are well off, and the rest of us are getting squeezed out. 
I ask you to vote against this project, and may I please have some applause? Yay. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello, and good afternoon to all the council members. Um, my name is Millennium X, and I'd like to say that I am opposed to this project, and I support the appeal because I don't think that developers should get these big exemptions from the zoning laws to build bigger and projects that hurt other people in the area. Traffic and congestions are getting worse. The proposed project is of the scale in the area is what is allowed under the law, and I don't think that it is fair because they are too tall and too dense. If the project is allowed to be built behind the Palladium, I think it should be smaller and it should be having a chance for the people. I think it's the impact on the congestion of the traffic is just too much. And it should have more housing available for the average person. I don't mean to be rude or disrespect anybody, but I don't want Hollywood to be turned into a downtown area. Thank you. Frankie De La Torre, Stanley Chapman, Sherm Wilson. Uh, good afternoon, council members. My name is Frankie Delatore. I work in Hollywood and also where I do my pharmacy and local stuff. Um, I don't support this project. I would like to see more uh, projects in Hollywood that are exactly consistent with the characters of Hollywood and that are affordable for more people. Luxury high-rises like this proposed project are not helping the housing problem in Los Angeles and that should be used as an excuse to vote yes on this project. There is no evidence that this project will actually help people who have not been able to find housing. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Stanley Chapman, and I'm here to say that I oppose this. This rendering looks very nice. So did the Target that's supposed to be built. So did the spaghetti factory that was built that people had to be evicted from because it didn't comply. I, stream, I hope that the council members will appeal to their better angels as we are the city of the angels and reconsider. I'm not against development, but I want smart development. I applaud the people and I thank the people for coming out and being so passionate about what they, how they feel because they feel that way. But I implore on the city council to be smart and think about what's going on and how they approve and give permission to build buildings. The, city, the artist rendering here looks nice, like I said, but is it really going to be the Thank way you, it sir. looks? Is it really going to do what it's supposed to do? Thank Are people you, in the community really going to be able to live there? Thank you, sir. We don't know. Thank you. <laughs> Sherm Wilson, Wesley Brittle, Jackie Sharble. Uh, good afternoon, uh, city council members. I'm happy to be here today, uh, but I am opposing this. Um, I ask that you vote against this project. I don't think that it's right that the city could allow such a big, uh, tall building to be put up in such a small place, and it's not zoned for this type of building. These are so many. There are so many huge buildings going up in our areas, and I don't think the city is really considering how much it's affecting the neighborhood. The people who are live and work in the area, the people who drive through Hollywood on their commute, I am against this development. But these projects is not in line with the law, and I don't understand why many, so many of them are going up all at once. It's loud, it's congested, the streets are closed, and there, will, there is no way that all the people moving in the area are going to take public transportation with how limited the metro is in L.A. The people yeah. who live in this expensive building is not going to take the bus. This project is too big and out of scale. I Ms. care about Wilson, Hollywood. If you could wrap it up. I'm trying to be fair to everyone. Your, your time is up. Thank all you. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council member, Council member 
uh, Mizar, Mizar, and other council members. Thank you for listening. Um, my name is Wesley Bridal. I'm from West Hollywood, and I'm here today to support the project, um, the proposed project. In my uh, town, speaking as a private citizen in my town, we have a big fight against development. All too many times, there are the same arguments that come up. There's the historical aspect of the building that's going to get taken down. There's the environmental aspect. There's the traffic jam. And I think that this project addresses all of those issues. And as someone who's attended so many events at the Palladium, I would really like to see this project approved. Thank you so much. You guys have a great day. Thank you. Jackie Sharbo, Marquise Lopez, and Wayne from Encino. Jackie Sharbo not here? No. Marquise Lopez. Wayne from Encino. Hello, my name is Marquise. You nice are to here. Meet you all. Okay. How are you? So I support the project, um, one, because they support jobs. They create jobs. Also, uh, housing, which is a big issue now in L.A. I know that might be a repetitive thing, rhetorical thing, but it's, it's a real thing. So um, actually growing up like that, this is something that is future for uh, myself, my little nieces, nephews, cousins who are in college. Like that, That's great thing. So I, I would like to see this. Thank you so much. Thank you. What is it? It's a new city. It might as well have its own mayor and city council. It's so goddamn big. You've completely redrawn everything. You violated every code section. This is fucking crazy. This is fucking crazy. Come on, even Lantham and Watkins won't win this. This is fucking crazy. I mean, Lant I know they're the Jesus Christ, but even Jesus is going to lose this fucking thing. It's, come on, this is too big. This is too big. Save the city the money. Go back to the drawing board. Item 12, we'll fuck with that, but come on with this. Too big. Come on, you two. Come on, you two. I know the two of you. Come on. Thumbs down. I know the pimple, the pimple vote for it, but you got to go down. It's a two-to-one vote. Vote no. Marquise, vote no. Cedillo, vote no. There's not enough affordable units. Okay, that finishes public comment for item number 10. We will now go to item 11. Uh, Daniel Wright, you have... Um, Daniel Wright here. You're right. Five minutes, sir. Thank you, Council Members. Daniel Wright of the Silverstein Law Firm on behalf of the Appellant AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Um, so, given this kind of disjointed presentation, um, I have decided to kind of feature a couple of things that I gave you, sort of an overview before. One is the, the idea that the land use analysis in the final EIR was um, so uh, deficient that it omitted the discussion of key aspects uh, of the entitlements and, or of uh, the approvals that were necessary. And, um, and so to, to that extent, uh, for instance, um, there were, um, for instance, with regard to the CRA regulations, uh, there were summaries of the CRA's regulations, but they, were, they omitted key aspects, in, including the fact that the CRA is um, responsible for approving a number of uh, these uh, entitlements. There's been some discussion in the, the, in the EIR um, the, the city actually stated that um, there was a process going forward with regard to transferring the responsibilities uh, of the land use development approvals from the CRA to the city. However, the, the last council file action that we were able to locate was in 2012 when the council um, decided to continue researching the issue, but since then 
has taken no significant ish, uh, um, uh, action toward that. So there's no question on this record that the CRA is a responsible agency, has a role to play, and as I had indicated earlier, had been excluded from both the notice of uh, preparation, in fact, they, in, by the fact that they did not receive it, it was never sent to them. Therefore, they did not participate in the process. Therefore, the public did not get an opportunity to weigh in on what issues they felt would be important in the EIR um, in order for the CRA to carry out its functions. Now, one of the, I wanted to go to the delimitation, which is on uh, the property in front. And the delimitation specifically says that the floor area ratio will be three to one. Um, however, it says that the board, uh, the Community Redevelopment Agency Board can find that it, com it complies with the redevelopment plan and two, a transportation program adopted by Community Redevelopment Agency pursuant to Section 518.1 of the Redevelopment Plan, comma, and if applicable, um, may um, any designs for des development that have been adopted. The phraseology, and if applicable, applying only to the designs for development is an indication that the requirement to complete a transportation program, particularly um, since this plan was last adopted in 2003, it's at least been um, 13 years since the CRA committed to have a transportation program in place and has failed to do so. So uh, for that reason, um, it seems that by the own wording of this uh, limitation, the bump in requested um, density cannot be granted by the CRA in the first place. On the general plan amendment, I just want to read um, from the final or the first report of the Citizens Committee on Zoning Practices and Procedures. That committee um, explained to the public after 14 months of investigation why it was necessary to restrict the scope of general plan amendments. They said, a completely piecemeal approach to the general plan amendment would defeat the principle of comprehensiveness and destroy the integrity of the plan. To prevent this, any change in the plan should be viewed in at least a community-wide context. Therefore, in the above recommendation, we propose that the recognized community areas with social economic identity be the minimum size units for general plan study and revision. In this project, you have an asphalt parking lot. That's the area proposed for a general plan amendment. Under no circumstances can you find, credibly, that a back parking lot, an asphalt parking lot, has some kind of social, economic, or physical identity within the meaning of your own charter. And so therefore, we would urge you to think very carefully about purposely and deliberately um, violating your own charter. Um, this process has been used for some time. Uh, it appears to have arisen a number of years ago, and there's no support for it. Thank you very much for your attention, and we urge that you send the project back for in a more appropriately sized project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Sterrett, how do you, are you going to speak for the five minutes? Yes, please, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Cindy Sterrett from Latham & Watkins on behalf of the Palladium in Crescent Heights. Uh, first of all, the council retains its legislative authority for general plan amendments. Um, in fact, it's ironic that AHF has nominated the Palladium to be a historic landmark, saying that it's significant, but is also saying that the parking lot and the Palladium can't together be the subject of a general plan amendment. Well, of course they can. AHF is proposing a separate initiative to try to deprive the council of its legislative authority to change the general plan, but under the current charter and the findings in the current charter, which have been fully satisfied here, you absolutely have that ability. And here we have not only that ability, but the legal mandate that zoning and the general plan should be consistent. So the general plan designation of regional center commercial on the little blue lot that I pointed out before, the back parking lot, will match the zoning. The zoning is C4. So not only is it appropriate under the charter, it's appropriate under zoning rules. And the CPC recommended it. Staff has proposed some additional findings to further clarify this is a significant social, economic, and physical element. 
The CRA has been fully involved in this process. In fact, there's a condition that the CPC adopted, and planning staff talked to the CPC about the CRA's role. The CRA has to be the one that agrees that this site should go from 3 or 4.5 to 1 to 6 to 1 through an owner participation agreement. Uh, That is their obligation. That is a condition that is before you. Other nearby sites, such as the CBS site across El Centro, is already red. You see that was a site-specific uh, plan amendment as well. So neither of the appellant's arguments, either that you have no legislative authority or that there's any problem here with the CRA's participation, are valid. The project-specific EIR fully analyzed all the land use issues, all the applicable issues, and everything is before you to justify the council's action. Um, I'd also like to point out that the substantial public benefits for this project do include affordable housing. Uh, The Planning Commission imposed a condition of 5% of the units, and we've estimated that's about 37 units, will be workforce housing, and staff has proposed language um, to you providing that the housing department will enforce that and make sure it's a fully enforceable measure, and we support that. The CPC also recommended very detailed conditions and findings that we're asking that you adopt. Um, One appeal was withdrawn at CPC, and there were some design modifications incorporated. Those have been reflected in the exhibit and are in the updated planning file. Um, The zoning conditions also incorporate historic preservation safeguards that Hollywood Heritage and the Los Angeles Conservancy have worked out with us. The appeal should be denied. The appeal should be denied for the reasons... um, stated by planning and in our letters responding to AHF's efforts to confuse and obstruct the city's process. The Planning Commission considered this fairly and thoroughly. In fact, they held a whole separate hearing at AHF's request. AHF said they needed extra time to review the record. And then at the second hearing, came back, no comments on the documents that they allegedly had been seeking to review. All the comments have been responded to, including a second errata to the EIR that planning had issued uh, two weeks ago, gave notice, by the way, to AHF, and our letter submitted to you on Thursday, making clear that all the issues have been thoroughly reviewed. The plan amendment and the zoning meets all the procedural and substantive requirements. As to transportation, we've looked at this issue very carefully, a very conservative study Caltrans, for example, was consulted. They have no problem with this analysis. Um, The project, in fact, selected the least impactful alternative. We had looked at a hotel, which would have had more traffic impacts as part of the project. We've dropped that, so we're going forward with the least impactful alternative, which is the 100% residential project and then ground floor retail as well as the Palladium. The ER was very thorough. Um, In fact, there were 25 technical reports, over 4,000 pages, Uh, CEQA litigation is all too common in Hollywood, and so staff has made sure that the full record before you includes all the detail that you need to make your decision, including issues of sustainability, issues of climate change. We've added electric vehicle chargers. We have solar panels. Uh, We've thoroughly analyzed uh, greenhouse gas impacts. Uh, This is a model project in terms of the process as well as the design of the project. So finally, we ask that you approve the actions that are before you, uh, the plan amendment, the zoning and height district change, uh, the site plan review, the zoning administrator interpretation, which will allow us to have very efficient parking, and the conditional use beverage for for alcohol sales um, that allows our retail to also serve the community. Uh, One of the public speakers earlier mentioned this is for the future And we know that's, you look to the future, and we ask for your approval so we can make the future better for Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce Bennon, do you wish to speak? One minute? No? Peyton Hall? Nope. Doug Haynes? Lisa Brereton? General Jeff? Tim McCosker, and our final speaker is Chris Robertson from CD13. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Doug Haynes. First off, uh, the agenda accurately states that these are condominium units, as you will note. Um, These are not apartments. There is no affordable housing. Workforce housing is not a legally accepted turn on the state level. A couple things from the EIR. Um, you know, I can barely see the clock, so I can see what my time is. Um, the EIR acknowledged that it would, this project would trigger the need for a new elementary school without identifying 
the funding source for that or the land for that? And Councilman Weezer, when you were at LASD, our neighborhood came to you because our neighborhood was going to be wiped out by a school. And I would think about the people whose home to be lost as a result of this project that goes through. Also, the parking is uh, assessed as a non-congested zone at 2.25. They're actually deficient by 175 spaces. And also, the EIR, even though it said there would be 8,000 trips under one scenario and 10,000 under another, said there was absolutely no cars whatsoever that would go through the historic Harold Way LaBange district one block away, which is just ludicrous. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Brereton. Good afternoon. My name is Liza Brereton. I'm both a resident of Hollywood and I work at AIDS Healthcare Foundation. As raised in our appeal letter, uh, general plan amendments are not permitted to be granted for this type of area. You can read the letter to get the background as Mr. Wright has described. AHF and I as a resident would support a responsible, accessible development on this site. I find it very distressing that the developer and the supporters here today um, have bought into the untrue statement of, of the developer that this project actually addresses the shor uh, ho housing shortage in Los Angeles. This is not true. There's no shortage of luxury housing in LA. There's a shortage of affordable housing. And the statement by Latham and Watkins attorney a moment ago that this project has affordable housing is incorrect. There's no affordable housing in this project. There's something called workforce housing, which is different and it's still minuscule. Please uh, consider these, these issues and don't just buy into the argument that this addresses the housing shortage. Thank you. Thank you. General Jeff, Tim McCosker, I <clears throat> missed uh, F the police uh, card, and then Chris Robertson. Good afternoon, committee. My name is General Jeff, speaking to you now as a West Coast hip-hop pioneer. Um, the Hollywood Palladium is dear to my heart. Um, not only have I performed there, I've performed there with well-known friends from LL Cool J to George Clinton Parliament Funkadelic. Um, I've even attended and played and had fun at the Hollywood Palladium with the, uh, annually with the Brazilian Carnival every year. And, um, you know, it's just a, a tremendously um, a, a historic place that's dear to the Hollywood community, which is also the entertainment capital of the world. And so what saddened me is the last few years that um, this project has actually just been kind of desolate a little bit. And so this is the very project that we feel can bring back the excitement and the energy. And I uh, look ve I'm very forward. I'm very excited about this project. So I look forward to all the newness and what it will do for not only that immediate area, but up and down the, uh, the Sunset Corridor. Um, I'm all in support. Thank you. Thank you. Tim McCosker, Glazer Weil, very briefly in support of the project. Um, I, am, um, I would really like to spend a little bit of time talking about increasing housing stock and the importance of workforce housing, but I would prefer to actually spend time correcting the record on the CRA issues which you heard about. The CRA, DLA, you know, the successor agency, is in fact on the original circulation list and has received every notification of the progress of this project. The CRA, DLA, as I understand it, made its choice that it wants to consider, will consider the, the uh, OPA following your action, and it is following this, this whole progress carefully. I'll also, I think, correct a very dense and, and uh, uh, difficult to understand argument about the, um, the delimitation. What you have in front of you is a proposed delimitation that deals with the height and the FAR. You have that in front of you. That's what you are considering. And you also have a condition in the approvals regarding the OPA. You have a very clean, well-conducted record. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Wayne. That's right. It's suicidal tendencies for these on-site consumption and off-site consumption booze venues. Too much booze. Too much booze. This is a wet street. It's a horribly wet city with liquor everywhere. Why the booze? Make affordable housing instead of the booze. Get rid of the booze. You don't want the booze? This is what you sound like when you drink too much. 
That's the kind of music when you start drinking too much. You don't want to drink all that liquor. So get rid of all of that liquor out of that project. I want a dry project, not a wet project. The general wants people sober. We don't want music like this. We want stuff like rap. I don't have enough time, but I'll play some NWA if there's time. Vote no on this. Thank you, Mr. Wayne. I was about to tell you to speak on the subject, but since you're playing Suicide of Tendencies, I decided to give you some leeway. Chris Robertson. Good afternoon, council members. Chris Robertson, planning director for council member Mitchell Farrell of the 13th district. We are here this afternoon to express our strong support for a project that has been in the works for over six years. Over that time, Crescent Heights has worked extensively with the historic preservation, residential, and business communities to build broad-based consensus and support for a project that will transform an existing surface parking lot into a vibrant mixed-use development that complements and restores the landmark Hollywood Palladium. As we noted at CPC, this extensive stakeholder involvement has resulted in a design that is lower in height than what was originally proposed and integrates a well-thought-out design with ground-level features that will enhance the streetscape and contribute to a more livable and dynamic community while bringing hundreds of much-needed housing to the city within walking distance of the red line. When the councilman took office, he met numerous times with Crescent Heights to stress his relentless commitment to addressing the city's affordable housing crisis and worked closely with the developer to negotiate that 5% of the total units be set aside as affordable for a minimum of 55 years so that the project will continue to provide a significant number of affordable units to those who need it most. As you know, the, applicant, the, the appellant has raised many questions about the general plan amendment and charter section 555. As you will see in planning's transmittal, there are detailed findings which show substantial evidence justifying the GPA. Not only is the project site entirely surrounded by land designated as regional, center commercial, and the community plan, but the Palladium has and will continue to have a significant social, economic, and physical identity in Hollywood. This is truly irrefutable. This project has garnered much attention, particularly over the last several months. The city is changing. We need to continue to grow our economy and make sure that our housing production, especially our lower income housing production, keeps pace with our jobs. While we grow and change, we need to preserve and protect our local history, aiming for balance and compromise. This project does just that. The Palladium project will be good for the economy and the future vitality of the Sunset Corridor in Hollywood by bringing jobs and mixed income housing, helping the city to address the significant socioeconomic and environmental impacts that stem from our existing land use patterns and the jobs housing imbalance. In closing, we would like to thank the planning department, especially Lucy Ibarra, for her diligent and thorough work on this project over the years. And we would also like to express our sincere thanks to Bruce Menon and the entire Crescent Heights team for continuing to work with our office over the months to fine tune the project's affordable housing component. With that, we respectfully ask for your support and that you approve the project with the revised findings and conditions proposed by planning with one minor modification. We would like to modify the project description and the conditions of approval to require 5% or 37 affordable units, whichever is greater. This way, the city will keep the same amount of affordable units if, for whatever reason, the total number of units decreases. Thank you very much, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Colleagues, are there any questions or comments on this item? Okay, we have two items before us, items number 10 and 11. I, I did have some questions on the uh, affordable housing component, but that was explained through some of the public testimony. Mm -hmm. um, did you hear anything that wasn't accurate in terms of the affordable housing component? No, the or? project is proposing a 5% set aside for workforce housing, and that's the AMI of 50 to 120%. Okay, all right. So that's Thank you. not. All right, so on item number 10, uh, I'll move that we deny the track MAC appeal and sustain the Planning Commission's determination to approve the vesting? If, if I may, I'd like sure. to address a couple of comments that were raised by the appellant. Sure, if, sure. Okay. Right so in. one of the first issues that came up was the appropriateness of the GPA and its relevance to Charter Section Section 555. I just want to clarify that the department's support of this GPA is to bring the site's um, 
zoning into consistency with the land use designation. As currently zoned, the property is um, has a CM zone, which is a commercial manufacturing zone, but is otherwise zoned um, QC4. Now, the C4 zone is not a corresponding zone to the commercial manufacturing zone, and the GPA is necessary to bring in consistency and conformity with the zoning and land use designation. <clears throat> So the appellant's assertions that this request is a bit-by-bit -bit amendment is an attempt to confuse the public from the fact that the GPA and zone change is necessary to correct an inconsistency where one exists. Charter Section 555 does not specifically assign limitations to the geographic scope of the GPAs, only that the general plan may be amended by subject elements or parts of subject elements or by geographic areas, provided that the part or area involved has significant social, economic, or physical identity. The appellant is attempting to confuse the charter provisions by suggesting that the amendment must satisfy all three or that partial amendments are not allowed. The city is entirely within its rights to correct an inconsistency where one exists. If, but if you were so inclined as to entertain the appellant's argument, the development of the site would also permit the surface parking lot to be redeveloped in a manner that continues the evolution of the identity of Hollywood. First, by serving as a studio support, then as a surfing parking, surface parking lot in support of the Palladium. Given the introduction of the Metro Red Line and the regional center land use designation on the project site and surrounding areas, the development of this parcel will encourage mixed-use development where the general plan specifically seeks to locate high-density housing and supportive uses near transit. Moreover, the development includes the preservation of the socially and regionally significant Palladium, and it also addresses the city's severe housing, crisis, housing crisis, which, without question, certainly meets the standard of having social and economic merits. As to the exceptions, um, as to the argument that R5 density is not allowed, that is incorrect. The exceptions provisions of the municipal code allows R5, dens R5 density for mixed-use projects and regional center designations. The, moreover, the um, applicant asserts that only the CRA can allow an increase in density of 6 to 1 through an OPA that is also incorrect. The Hollywood Community Plan includes footnote 9, which permits projects to a maximum of 6 to 1 through a transfer of development rights procedure and or city planning commission approval, which happened here and which they're appealing and is before you now. As to the applicant's um, assertions that the CRA was not notified or had any participation in the development or the procedures or processes associated with this project, that is also incorrect and factually, factually false. The CRA is on the city's distribution list for all EIRs. The CRA also received a copy of the determination issued by the City Planning Commission relative to the FAR to 6 to 1 that they have not submitted any letters or correspondence to indicate their objections is indicative of the CRA's approval and general um, awareness of the project and the associated requests. As previously mentioned, there's a condition of approval that states that prior to the issuance of a building permit, the project is, is required to enter into an, um, an open owner participation agreement with the CRA. Again, the CRA has seen this language and has, has raised no objections. The appellant statement that the land use analysis in the final EIR is deficient, and that is true because he did not look at the draft EIR where the land use analysis is located, so that probably raises the, the question as to why he didn't find it. The, the land use analysis in the EIR disclose all applicable plans and procedures that are relevant to this project in a manner that is reflected to the pattern and practice of the city's development and, and adoption of um, EIRs. The CRA's failure to adopt a transportation or design guidelines does not render the and land use analysis of the EIR in, um, it doesn't render it as inadequate because if there's no adopted guideline to analyze, then we certainly cannot analyze that. And I think that satisfies all my comments, unless you had something specific that you wanted me to address. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harris Dawson? Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to everybody that came and uh, was a part of this discussion today. Really simple, narrow, uh, and specific question. The workforce housing, how much does that cost? I don't know what that costs, but I can tell you that this, the, I don't know what it costs to construct, but I can tell you that. What does it cost to live in it? So the city, um, the housing 
and Community Investment Department has a schedule that determines rent levels for very low, low, and moderate income housing. That assigns every year um, the rent limits for the um, for those for those units. The workforce housing as defined in this um, condition of approval is 50 to 120 percent, and that satisfies the provisions of low and moderate income levels. So the Schedule 6, I think it's called Schedule 6 of HCID's annual rent levels would correspond to the approvals that are before you today relative to workforce housing. Does that help? Okay, so so the Housing and Community Investment Department assigns specific rent levels every year. Right, no, I, I appreciate it. I don't need the formula. I'm just trying to under, because work, workforce is a, is a wide range of people, right? So Tom Hanks is a worker, and my no, first no, grade no. teacher is so a worker. So workforce housing, as defined in the code, is 50 to 120% of the area median income. So whatever the income levels are, and again, the housing department determines these income levels for the city. So the city, so it says for a family of one, for example, there's a certain annual income limit for that. For, and it ranges from a, a, a household of one person to multiple persons. And it assigns specific income levels for that size of family. And then what it does is state that these are the rent levels for unit types. And the unit types are single, one, two, and three bedroom units. And so based on the income level and the size of that household, then they assign specific rents for the type of unit. Perhaps it would be helpful, Councilman, to simply ask the housing department for those numbers. I'd like to make such a request. Are they here? They're not, but you can simply ask them to include that as yeah. part of the... Uh, Terry Kaufman Macias, the developer's representative, says she knows the answer to your question if you want to ask her. That would be fabulous. Uh, Councilmember Cindy Starrett, um, on behalf of Crescent Heights, we've done some research. We think the range will be from about $400 a month for people that are at that, the lower end of that range. Um, the 40% of median up to 120% might be paying closer to $1,000 a month. Got it. Thank you. Mr. Cedillo? It's 5%. Did, did so, everybody hear the question? Yeah. Yeah. Can you speak into the microphone, Mr. Sand? Turn it, turn it on, please. Now, I know you said there's 5%. That's 37 units. But how many will be at these various levels? How many units? So 5% of the 731 units will be restricted affordable at the 50 to 120%. And what the council office recommended that 5% of whatever's built be maintained on the project site. And then do we know from the developer beyond that what the other uh, prices are? Can we get some ranges? Uh, yeah, the, the project is primarily studios and one bedrooms. Approximately half of the units are small units. So the absolute rents uh, just don't get that high. That's why the appellants and the opponents have sort of mischaracterized this as super luxury housing. Because of the size of the units, the rents, even at a market rate, will start at anywhere from $1,200 to $1,250 a month. So these are not rents, you know, if you think about somebody paying $1,200 a month or $14,000 a year and your rent should be a third of your income, you know, these are people that are, are making working salaries in Hollywood. And um, there will be some larger units. You know, there's a variety of unit sizes. There's smaller two bedrooms. Unit sizes maybe go up to about 1,200 square feet. So this notion that this is a luxury project or these are huge condominiums or very, very high rents is, is not really true. And I think the reason why the council, I don't want to speak for the council, but I think the reason why the project's been so well supported is because other than the officially restricted rents at 5%, the balance of the units, because of the unit sizes, uh, produce absolute rents that are achievable for working general working people. I hope, I hope that answers your question. Mr. Chairman, if I can, um, I just, you know, you've heard me say this, uh, in housing, we have a housing crisis, we need 100,000 units of housing, and we need it now. We need it at every level. Uh, this is not an exclusive luxury housing 
project, but even if it were, it would merit our support because we're, we need 100,000 units of housing at all levels, at the lowest, lowest entry level micro unit to the highest level, most luxurious unit. Uh, we need it at every level. Half of it should be affordable, maybe a little less than half should be affordable of the 100,000 units. But we need another 50,000 units of, of higher end workforce, and I don't want to use your vernacular, but housing for teachers, for professionals, for new professionals, for millennials, for uh, public safety, for a whole range of people in the workforce. And we need it all and we need it now. And so that, that adds uh, to the argument to offer somewhere between, uh, what is this project, 735 units. I mean, that's extraordinary in terms of moving us uh, in that direction. This seems to meet all the criteria and concerns that we would have. We talk about it's transit-centered. It, it offers a, a, a sufficient tranche of affordability. Uh, it has density where density should be. Uh, it appears from the response from the community that there is significant uh, community support uh, for this. For those of us in the uh, homeless um, committee, every unit of housing that we move people in, it means creates opportunities to free up more uh, housing. Uh, it creates jobs, and not just construction jobs, but your retail, your maintenance, your service, all of which will have a ripple effect in the community. It's difficult not to support uh, this project. This is, I think, in many respects, a model project with a model development. I think our opportunity is to move it forward so that uh, it can be executed in the way that it is being envisioned. I think uh, someone said it best earlier that we need to stop trading our future for someone's past, that we really need to build on our past, and that is the preservation part of this, which is stellar. We need to build on our past, but build towards a collective future that all of us can share in, and I think this project does that. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? No. So with that, uh, I'll move that uh, we uh, deny the track for number 10, move uh, to deny the track map appeal and sustain the Planning Commission's determination to approve the vesting tentative track map. And in, in Councilman, on number 10, there's also a haul route. A what? A haul route. A haul route. Yeah. Route or route? I don't know. <laughs> you pick. I, I don't know either. I'm you just pick. asking. <laughs> we both kind of have similar backgrounds, so we probably pronounce it the same way, right? It yeah. depends what part of the country you're from. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Tomato, tomato, potato, potato. Uh, and do we have to make any uh, amendments for the uh, motion, or is that uh, we have to approve the hall route as well? Yes. Okay. So you're approving and, the well, track map and the hall route and well, certifying, certifying the EIR. Okay. Thank you. So and denying we'll, the appeal. And deny the appeal. Yes. Said that. So we will... Uh, I just want to add that um, in your motion to deny the appeal, to certify the EIR, and, and to approve the hall route, that you're also incorporating the corrections that I suggested in my letter that was dated March 14th. Okay. We're doing that. That's on number 10, correct? Correct. Yeah, number 10. Yeah. We'll take that all in and incorporate it. Um, any objection? See none. So ordered. On item 11... Uh, move to deny um, the second appeal and sustain CPC's determination to approve the general plan amendment, zone change, and related entitlements, including certification of the EIR. And I just want to add that together with that, there's a subsequent letter on data from planning department staff dated March 14th relative to the corrections to the queue conditions and the additional findings, but also whether or not you should consider the council office's request that the language be modified to 5% or 37 units, um, depending on the Whichever size is greater. of the project. Yeah. Okay. Whichever is greater was yeah. the language. We will uh, incorporate those into the motion. Any objections? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll now move on to item number 12. Um, item 12, Councilman, is a motion by Councilman O'Farrell and yourself. It's instructing uh, that the Hollywood Palladium be designated as a historic cultural monument and for the commission to begin the process. Thank you. Um, 
for CD13, do you wish to present on this or do you want to speak on it uh, after, the pub after the comments? Okay, we'll go straight to public comments. This is a motion presented by council office. David Wright, Cindy Sterrett, Heather Crossner, Doug Haynes. This is all one minute on this item. Good day, council members. Uh, Daniel Wright um, on behalf of AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Uh, the curious thing about this nomination is that uh, when we review the municipal code process set up by the city, we see nothing that uh, results in a council member initiation, which is merely a motion, to override uh, a pending application filed by another applicant. That applicant, as a matter of constitutional law, is, has a right to a hearing that's been afforded to that applicant under um, the city's laws. It appears that other projects have been advanced ahead of ours and that we're being treated differently for reasons that are not explained. And our application is entitled to a hearing as well, especially since there may be a differing analysis with regard to significant character defining uh, aspects of the project. So with that, we would support um, the idea of a nomination, but our nomination should be heard as well because we have a right. Thank you. Thank you. Cindy Starr, um Heather Crossner, either one? Good afternoon, honorable council members. Heather Crossner from Latham & Watkins speaking on behalf of CH Palladium. We are pleased today to support Councilman O'Farrell's motion to initiate nomination of the Hollywood Palladium. As you've heard in today's testimony, the Palladium is a centerpiece of the Palladium Residences Project. The property owner has always supported its nomination as part of its project. There are others who have tried to assert their own control over the landmark nomination process as a tool to block the project. That disrespects the appropriate role of the landmark process and is abuse of that process. The only threat to the Palladium here is created by AHS efforts to oppose the entitlement conditions that require investment in its preservation and enhancement. We believe the city is the best steward of the landmark process to ensure historic protections are created while allowing this operating venue to remain viable into the future. We ask everyone who supports the Palladium's designation to support the Councilman's motion to proceed with nomination and ask for the Plum's recommendation today. Thank you. Thank you. Cindy Starrett, Doug Haynes, uh, Mickey Jackson. Hi, Cindy Starrett on behalf of CH Palladium. And I just wanted to clarify that the entitlements that you just approved um, include a condition which requires that the property owner nominate the Palladium as a monument um, in conjunction with those approvals. Um, the councilman has suggested that the city should proceed first and the city would move forward immediately uh, with that nomination process, um, basically making sure that the nomination happens sooner. Uh, we're supportive of that. Um, however, as the property owner, we also are committed to moving forward with all the things that only the property owner can do. We have a lease with Live Nation. We've agreed not to demolish the Palladium. In fact, a significant amount of money has been invested in the Palladium um, so it can continue to operate as a concert venue. Uh, we've agreed with Hollywood Heritage and the Los Angeles Conservancy to execute a conservation easement, and the conditions also require us to move forward with a preservation plan that will require investment as part of the entitlements. So we will move forward as part of the entitlements, but we also support the city moving first. Thank you. Thank you. Doug Haynes. Mickey Jackson, Charles Fisher, and Wayne from Encino. Hi, my name is Doug Haynes. I'm going to defer primarily to Charlie's comments on this, but um, I have real concerns as a former board member of Hollywood Heritage and also as the person that nominated the Cinerama Dome. That was a highly politicized process that an applicant can go to the council member and basically torpedo a nomination that was properly filled out and submitted, and that's the case that occurred here. The nomination went in, I believe, in October. Um, so, again, Charlie can speak more on this issue, but when this project came before our neighborhood council, I specifically asked about the queue condition for preservation, and I was told, and as you will acknowledge, that there is no guarantee that the preservation will occur, and that um, when we requested of the applicant whether or not they would support someone else who would apply for a preservation and nomination of this, they said they would not because they want to control the process rather than just be a fair and objective manner. Thank you. Thank you. Mickey Jackson. 
I, too, object to the way this has been handled. I agree with the objective of saving the Palladium, but it is important the path you take, and I think the city council is removing civil rights for no good reason. Um, I also am concerned that, I, that down the street from this project at Columbia Square, there were very specific uh, conditions that, that Columbia Square do a good amount of rehabilitation, and it was spelled out what that was, and it protected that much better than the palladiums being protected. We don't have the guarantees we need. The last thing I would say is that for all the talk, and as we all know, talk is rather inexpensive, for all the talk of preservation, the people who put in the nomination and tried to go to the pro through the process they're entitled to is AHF. The palladium folks that we've heard so many, such lengthy things from, could have at any time, but they didn't. Thank you. Charles Fisher, Wayne from Encino, and Chris Robertson, CD13. Good afternoon, Charlie Fisher, 140 South Avenue 57. I want to say this particular nomination uh, was submitted actually last summer. It was submitted about the same time as the Red Wine Building was on uh, Las Palmas. The Red Wine Building is now waiting to come here to Plum. It has gone through the system. Uh, we are concerned about the delays. Um, there was a nomination for the Palladium submitted or asked for by Councilmember Garcetti back in 2012. That nomination just fell by the wayside. All we're asking is that this thing go through. And by the way, contrary to popular belief, I doubt there's going to be much difference between the two nominations. But I don't know that for sure because I have not seen anything else submitted. My nomination is done based upon the historic merits of the building. And no, the parking lot is not listed as a character defining feature. Thank you. Thank you. Wayne and uh, Chris Robertson. How sneaky. You get the Hollywood Palladium and the parking lot as a cultural monument. You build up on it. And what do you get? A break in the property taxes. It's terrific. Not only are you going to be building your own city, you're going to get a break in the property taxes because you are modifying and building upon a cultural historical monument. That's your little, that's your little thing in CD13. That's your old feral. No, we don't want that. We want the nomination for the Palladium as it stands now. Sands parking lot. No parking lot. A parking lot is not a cultural monument. So let them build it, pay the property taxes, and don't try to get a reduction in the property taxes under monument status for new buildings. That's what O'Farrell's trying to do, but some of us aren't that fucking stupid, are we? We watch these things. Ms. Chris Robertson. Good afternoon again. Chris Robertson, Planning Director with Councilmember Mitch O'Farrell. Um, as you know, the designation, protection, and restoration of the Palladium has always been a very important part of this project. There was an application filed. Uh, there was a motion previously introduced in the past to initiate designation, um, and that was always the intent of the developer. Uh, but most importantly, the act that you just took here today a certified or upheld pre previous certification of the environmental impact report, which includes a historical resource analysis. So it's extremely important to the councilman that the city has all the information that it needs to make an informed decision about the designation. I would defer to planning department on the process, but it is our intent to move this forward as expeditiously as possible. And if I understand from planning, um, they may be able to get it to the commission as soon as April or May. So we look forward to that happening. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Good afternoon, Council Members. Ken Bernstein with Department of City Planning and Office of Historic Resources. I did want to just respond to some of the comments that have been made about the Cultural Heritage Commission process, the Historic Cultural Monument application. 
Um, wanted to make clear, first of all, the provisions in question are not in the municipal code, uh, as cited by the appellant, but in the uh, administrative code, our cultural heritage ordinance, which does give the director of planning discretion as to the timing of uh, uh, deeming an application complete. In this case, uh, this is a situation where we had an application submitted to our office and then subsequently a council motion was introduced for the same property. Uh, we felt it was most appropriate to take those two uh, potential initiations together uh, because it is possible, as even the appellants just acknowledged, that there might be subtle differences in uh, the information that is submitted by the uh, outside party and what is coming forward as part of the council initiation. It would be important for the Cultural Heritage Commission for our staff to reconcile any differences uh, and make a single recommendation to the commission um, and moving it forward to the city council. So with this initiation now coming to Plum and council, uh, the, the council initiation moving forward, we are intending to schedule the nomination for uh, consideration by the Cultural Heritage Commission on May 19th and would expect it would come back uh, a couple of months later before the city council. It, I want to make clear that in no way has this affected the project review that has been before you in items uh, 10 and 11 and the uh, City Planning Commission's consideration. It's important to point out that the Palladium is already a historic resource and has been treated as such under the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, and is a historic resource under the uh, Community Redevelopment Agency, which we've heard cited today. The CRA's Hollywood Redevelopment Plan treats this as a historic resource. In fact, the Hollywood Plan has probably the most stringent protections for historic resources of any of the redevelopment plans in the city. These plans do still remain in effect, and they require, in the case, this one requires in the case of Hollywood, that any project work on a historic resource such as the Palladium meet historic preservation standards, the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation, the very same standards we would use if it already were designated as a historic cultural monument. And then secondly, that um, uh, any demolition goes through a significant review process that essentially mirrors the very same review process that would be in place if it were already designated as a historic cultural monument. So in essence, it's uh, already being treated uh, as essentially equivalent to a historic cultural monument. It's been acknowledged that it is eligible for designation, and we look forward uh, through the Office of Historic Resources to um, consolidating the, the two nominations and bringing this to the commission to Council very expeditiously. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bernstein. Any questions or comments? No? I certainly look forward to this evaluation. Um, they sure don't make them like they used to. Uh, having been there two weeks ago, every seat is a great seat, and uh, it's great to see these venues preserved. Hopefully, uh, we'll see some good objective analysis that would designate it as such. All right. Um, any objections? Uh, we'll adopt this motion and move it forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe that brings us to pu general public comment. Yes. We have two speaker cards, uh, Wayne from Encino and Doug Haynes. Wayne. So big win today for all the pigs. All the developers, they won. All the over-densifiers. All the unions. Lantham and Watkins. Yes, all of them came in here and fed today. There was a lot of feeding there today. What's missing? What's missing is the lawsuit that unravels the whole thing. Why? Too much bullshit at one time. So you have to understand, it's called reasonable notice. Nobody can understand what this is. Nobody can understand that. Look at that book. What does that book look like to you? That book looks like a book of failure. You'll be sorry for approving it. We will save the palladium, but the feeding must stop. Doug Haynes.
Hang in there, Gil. I'm almost, we're almost out of here. Um, my name is Doug Haynes, and next Tuesday you're scheduled to hear the Target at Sunset and Weston project. That would make, can, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Um, I'm sorry, can you hold this time until that noise passes by? Thank you. Um, thank you very right, much. Go ahead. Thank you. It, this will be, if it's heard next Tuesday and not continue, to be the 12th time I've come before this committee. It would be the fifth time it's come before City Council. Um, I just want to point out some things for people who aren't familiar with the case, and hopefully I go over a second. You'll give me that extra time. Target originally came into the area intending to construct a one-story co-compliant store, but what had happened, and this could have been opened eight years ago, it was a store that the community would have supported. What happened is that the councilman at the time, Eric Garcetti, said he did not want to observe SNAP's regulation. He wanted heightened density on Sunset Boulevard. In October of 2007, Target signed a 75-year lease at the site at $1.895 million a year and has wasted over $16 million on the site alone just for rent. Um, Target, at the same time, was saying that it could not afford subterranean parking and assessed the cost at about $5 million. So, I, I, I mean, my point is we as a community have been trying to work to have our laws obeyed. You talk about housing. They could have gone to 75 feet by bright if they had included a housing component. Thank you. They have not done that. And so if we come to you next week, I hope you consider that we've been trying diligently to work these things out, but we want our laws obeyed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our meeting. Uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you.